Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, I'll call back into open session this meeting of the Arlington Independent School District Board of Trustees for January 17th at uh, 7, 18 p.m. Thank everybody for coming out tonight to be with us. We'll start our meeting with the opening ceremony. <clears throat> Please join Mr. Hogg in leading us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If you would please uh, silence your cell phones and join me in a short moment of silence. Thank you. Our uh, opening ceremony tonight is the Miller Fiddlers. Under the direction of Holly Burton, Ms. Burton has taught in the AISD for 10 years, and this is her fifth year at Miller Elementary. The Miller Fiddlers is made up of gifted and talented sixth grade string students at Miller Elementary. The students audition to be in the group and then rehearse every week before school to learn their music. In addition to performing for the school board tonight, the group has performed for the 2012 AISD Teacher of the Year Banquet, the residents at the Arlington Plaza, PTA meetings, caroling in the Miller Foyer, and special appearances at the Miller Musicals. Tonight they will be performing Canon in D by Johan Pachabel, arranged by Spenson. Even Ms. Burton. Thank you. 
Thank you again to the Miller Fiddlers under the direction of Miss Holly Burton. Miller Elementary. Priced help out there tonight. Huh? <laughs> what? Next item on the agenda is School Board Appreciation Month. Miss Amy Casas is on. Superintendent Cavazos, President Barron, and members of the board. This month is School Board Recognition Month and a good time to honor your hard work and dedication to the children of this district. It has become tradition for the Communications Department to work with Visual Arts and Journalism Coordinator Lynn Nguyen to select a school to bring to life the theme that reflects the district's appreciation for your service. This year's theme is Rising to New Heights. School board members shoulder critical responsibilities as advocates for our children. They face difficult challenges and make hard decisions with the overall goal of promoting student achievement. Working as a vital link between the community and the classroom, we truly appreciate you for voluntarily tackling the enormous job of governing the Arlington Independent School District. At this time, I would like to introduce Andrea Powers, our teacher at Williams Elementary. Ms. Power's students worked very hard to bring to life our theme for this year's appreciation. After Ms. Power's presentation, the United Educators Association will also make a brief presentation to honor our board. Distinguished members of the board, President Barron and Dr. Cavazos, good evening. As a citizen of Arlington, I see the presence you have in our community and the collaboration between our schools and the community, and for that, I thank you. As a parent of an Arlington Lamar graduate and also a parent of two Duff Elementary children, I know how the students in our district are being inspired daily and are being prepared for success, and for that, I thank you. As an employee, I commend your dedication and your leadership and I'm excited to see your vision as presented in the new strategic plan, and for that, I thank you. On behalf of the students in the district, it's my honor to present you with original works of art from students at Williams Elementary to each of you as a token of our appreciation for the work that you do to make our school district outstanding. Your dedication, commitment, and leadership to our district is invaluable. To each of you, again, thank you. Our first artist, Hannah Rushlew. <laughs> Hannah has painted you a butterfly. Um, when the caterpillar becomes a butterfly, it is able to rise to heights it never imagined possible. But it cannot begin that amazing transformation without receiving what it needs from its surroundings. Our students will be able to make their amazing transformations and rise to their new heights after receiving a quality education while attending Arlington ISD schools. Hannah wants to be a nurse when she grows up because she says she wants to help people. She's fortunate she attends school in a district whose leaders value preparing her to excel in higher education so she can reach her dreams and will one day fly. Our next artist is first grader Emmy Alvarez. Emmy has used chalk pastels and paint to create a sunflower for you. The sunflower takes in water, sunlight, and carbon dioxide provided by its environment and uses these things to create the food it needs to grow to new heights. Emmy says she loves school because she learns new things and does fun activities. She will take in knowledge encouragement and experiences provided by her highly qualified teachers and will use these things to reach her maximum potential. She will continue to grow and bloom because of these invaluable nutrients given to her. Up next we have second grader Cindy Wynn. Cindy's used oil pastels to create a mighty tree for you. A tree grows steadily and strong, taking what it needs from the environment and also providing oxygen back to its environment at the same time. 
Because Arlington ISD fosters a caring culture of respect, integrity, wellness, and citizenship throughout the district, like the tree, our students will draw what they need to continue to grow steadily and become strong, but will also be equipped to give back to their community in their own unique way. Okay. Third grader Amari Bell, something came up last minute and she cannot be here, but she has created a hot air balloon. Amari wrote, when I grow up, I want to be an artist above her balloon because you recognize the value of arts education beginning at the elementary level, she has already found her passion. The education and training she will receive while attending a district that values the arts will be her hot air balloon and will take her to her new heights. Our next artist is Nathan Wynn. Nathan has drawn and painted a koi fish for you. The koi fish is a symbol of strength and good fortune. There's an ancient legend of a koi fish who was able to swim up a waterfall vertically and emerged as a mighty dragon. With the strong foundation provided to Nathan, he will surely be able to conquer the waterfalls he encounters and emerge stronger than ever. This will serve him well as Nathan wants to be a marine when he grows up. Fifth grader Jennifer Rivera's artwork shows hands reaching toward a dream as represented by the sun. She says her dreams include making it as an artist and also becoming a marine biologist. Through relevant, innovative, and rigorous learning ex experiences, our students will succeed in reaching their maximum potential and will reach their dreams. Fifth grader Sydney Aguirre has illustrated her dream to become a scientist. A hands-on experiment earlier this school year involving mixtures and solutions inspired a new love of chemistry for her. On her list of things to accomplish as a scientist are to develop new medicines and to make cars that are fueled by trash. We are waiting for you, Sydney. <laughs> Arlington ISD's dedication to providing world-class facilities and leading edge experiences will be an important stepping stone for her while she is on her way to discovering new things in her future as a scientist. Our last artist is sixth grader Eric Tran. Rising to new heights to Eric means exploring new places and going somewhere you've never been before. He wants to be an artist and wants to travel to new places when he grows up. He has illustrated this desire by showing himself in a rocket ship traveling to outer space. We've all heard the phrase, the sky's the limit, but to Eric, there are no limits. Please accept, go ahead. Please accept these pieces of artwork as a token of our appreciation. When you're having a rough day, when you receive an angry phone call, when you look at your schedule and think another meeting, if you ever have one of those days and begin to doubt you're making a difference, look at the piece of art given to you tonight and remember you are. Through your vision, dedication, and leadership, you have laid the foundation for an infinite number of possibilities for the students in Arlington ISD. Thank you. Well, good evening. Uh, President Barron, Even Mr. Dr. Bossos, members of the board. Uh, it's my extreme pl pleasure and privilege as the president of United Educators Association to uh, acknowledge you for uh, School Board Appreciation Month. And uh, what we're offering is nothing close to what those, the young children of Miller did. And as a matter, it was very poignant for me because it made me think of my own children who have gone through the school system and, and how well they're doing in their careers and their lives right now. And it's the dedication that, you, that members of the board do every day. And I know that, that what I'm about to tell you, you don't already know, it's a lot of long hours, hard work, and great pay, right? <laughs> so it's fun for me because I get to get up here and say thank you. I've gotten to know every one of you. I've worked with many of you. and. I respect you. I want you to know. I may not agree with you every time, but I respect what you're doing, and I applaud you. And in your honor, each one of you, we are making a contribution to the AWARE Foundation 
and the Arlington Education Foundation, two of the organizations that I know that are very integral and important to our district. And thank you once again, and uh, I hope you get some time off soon. But thank you very much. Thank you to all the students at Miller. <clears throat> Ms. Casas, you're back on again. <clears throat> President Barron, Dr. Cavazos, members of the board, it is my honor to introduce uh, some, some people that are here tonight to, to introduce the MLK Art and Essay Contest winners. As you know, every year we partner uh, with this great event, and it is a, a wonderful event, and I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the hard work of Leslie Johnston and Lynn Wynn, who really dedicate a lot of time on behalf of the school district to help the committee put this together. And I'd like to introduce uh, Felicia Battles and Nita Halliburton with TCC, who are co-chairing co this year's MLK celebration. And Anita's gonna introduce the student winners and Felicia will provide an overview of the four day celebration. Good evening. My name is Nita Halliburton and this is Felicia Battles. We are the co-chairs this year of the Citywide Sharing the Dream, Martin Luther King Sharing the Dream celebration. We are also employed at Tarrant County College where Dr. Bill Coppola is the president. And this year, we are the chairs. We get the chance to serve as the hostesses for this great celebration. There are five entities that are involved with this celebration every year. Those entities are Tarrant County College, the University of Texas at Arlington, City of Arlington, UTA, and the Ministerial Association. And we, we uh, rotate turns on who gets to serve as host. And the turn fell to Tarrant County College this year. One of the events that we sponsor every year is the uh, essay contest. We, we come up with a theme, we present that theme to the students here in the Arlington ISD and some of the outside uh, school districts. But we present that theme, they present essay material to us and we have judging and we choose a, a winner. And we actually choose three winners <coughs> And the prizes that these students are able to get, the first place winner receives a $1,000 scholarship, second place winner receives a $750 scholarship, and the third place winner wins a $500 scholarship. Now at the same time that we're doing the essay contest, we also do an art contest. And same, the same um, monies apply, the same prizes apply. Well, this evening, we are happy to present one of the winners for the art contest. The student is with us. Her name is Tashana Miles, and she is from Arlington High School. She's 17. Tashana, will you come forward? Do you show this to them? This is the artwork that she presented. The other winners who unfortunately could not be here this evening, the second place art winner, Kevin Mujo from Juan Seguin High School, he's 16. The third place winner, Taryn Leon from James Martin High School. The essay contest winners, the first place winner was Chanel Brown from James Martin High School, she's a senior. The second place winner, Daniel Tran, James Martin High School, and the third place, Kristen Link from Arlington High School. Thank you. And at this time, I would like to call any of the members for the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Committee to please come forward. We would like to invite each of you to join us this weekend for the festivities. We will kick off tomorrow evening's our big celebration is the awards banquet where these winners of the art and essay contest will also be recognized tomorrow evening and receive their scholarship. And on Saturday, we will start bright and early with our annual MLK step competition, followed by the Multicultural Festival and ending our evening with slam poetry. On Sunday evening is our ecumenical service on Monday morning is our MLK Day of Service and new this year, we are having a special breakfast and economic opportunity fair for military veterans and their families. 
and we will end our celebration on Monday evening with our grand finale, the Youth Musical Extravaganza. And at this time, we would like to present each of you with a token of our celebration, of our committee, I'm sorry. This it's going to be a t-shirt with the award winning artwork. And for more information regarding each event, we have flyers out front. If you want more information regarding each event for its location and time, or you may visit our website at arlingtonmlk.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Next item on the agenda is, uh, let's see. Yeah, no, right now. Uh, during our December 13th meeting, the Board of Trustees announced that the elementary school to be located on Sherry Street in East Arlington will be named in honor of former Arlington High School principal James Adams and his wife Barbara, a longtime teacher at Hill Elementary. James and Barbara Elementary will open in the fall of 2013. <clears throat> we are going to officially recognize James and Barbara. James worked in the AISD for 38 years and served as a teacher, counselor, and administrator at four AISD schools before being named principal at Arlington High School, where he remained for 15 years before retiring in 2008. As principal, he led the school through significant changes, including the addition of the freshman class to the high school, building extensions to accommodate the additional 1,000 students, and the implementation of the International Baccalaureate Program. Barbara also worked in the ASD for 38 years. She spent her tenure as a sixth grade language arts teacher at Hill Elementary. James and Barbara, we are honored to have you here this evening and to recognize you for your service. I might note that James Adams is the person who hired me at Arlington High School. And for that, I thank you forever. Mr. Adams, would you like to say a few words? Mr. Barron, he graduated me also, so. Yeah, well, we're trying not to hold that against him. <laughs> right. Mr. Hogg, would you like to say anything before we go too far? Yeah, we'll just say congratulations. Uh, I look forward to seeing Adams Elementary, and, and from the touches Miss Adams made at Hill Elementary. Um, you can hear about all the time and the students touched to Mr. Adams from his first year was my first year at Arlington High. I think I was the first class that went through with you and you implemented block scheduling which we all know can be interesting and and the way you embrace students it, it was truly amazing and I, I think it was amazing to watch it once it was named um, from everyone across the community how excited they were for both of you. And I don't think we could name anyone better. So thank you for that. President Barron, members of the board and Dr. Cavazos, we are so excited. James and I drive to Sherry Street to see the school a couple of times each week. <laughs> Every day we talk about the building the future staff, the community, and the precious students. It will be such a joy to see the children and their families come to Adams Elementary on the first day of school next year. We can't wait to see their faces when they see the beautiful new building for the first time. I believe it will be life-changing for the children to have the opportunity to go every day to school to such a modern, pleasant, warm, and light-filled environment. I am so proud that we live in a city and have a school district that values the education of individual students. I want to thank you for this incredible honor. Thank you to the school board for choosing us to be the namesakes. Thanks to each and every one of you for your votes and support. I also want to thank our, thank our daughters, son-in-law and grandchildren for their love, support and enthusiasm about the name for the new school. They have always been our biggest fans. We are so proud that Jennifer and Gary and Melissa are teaching in the AISD and every day being a positive influence on children's lives. The five of us have worked for a total of over 120 years 
for the Arlington Independent School District. <laughs> Our poor girls didn't have a chance because they grew up grading papers and making bulletin boards. <laughs> I want thanks to the entire Arlington community for supporting us. Our beloved students have stayed in touch with us through the years and many have brought their children back for us to educate. Many have even come to teach with us. Matt Bostick is here tonight. He taught sixth grade with me at Hill. <laughs> was my former student. Parents and other community members have been so generous to trust us with their greatest treasures. We share their family's prides in our former students' achievements. It was a joy to teach them. I appreciate all of the wonderful and amazing educators that I've worked with through the years at Thornton and John's elementaries in the 70s and then at Hill Elementary for 31 years. I'm grateful to my patient and encouraging principals, assistant principals, staff members, fellow teachers, and teammates. I see so many of my dear coworkers from Hill here tonight. Laurie Palomino was my coworker and is the last one standing in sixth grade at Hill. <laughs> Mary Lee Ross and I taught school sixth graders together for 10 years, and then she was my principal for my last eight years. She has always been my friend. Those hill days, everyone that's here would agree, those hill days were and are golden years, golden times. James and I are both proud and happy and humble to be honored in this way. Thank you very much. Bye. President Barron, members of the board, Dr. Gavassas. Um, Peter, you and Bowie should know how dangerous it is to give me an open mic and a captive <laughs> audience. <clears throat> I can go on all night, but I'm not. I wrote something down, I'm gonna stick to the script. If anybody told me back in 1970 when I walked into Nichols Junior High and met Dory e. Nichols, the school namesake, that I'd be standing here tonight as a namesake, I probably would've laughed at the improbability of that happening. Uh, I'm grateful for so many people who were instrumental in my career. Uh, I can't name all the teachers and administrators and support staff, parents, students, everybody. And I think that's what I like most about Arlington, everybody working together. I, I think that, uh, I think we have always had a good handle on why we're here. And it is for kids. And I think the kids know that. And, and it's reflected in, in the the work that's done here. I uh, did work at five schools here and loved my time at all five. I did spend 15 of those years at Arlington High School and sometimes that seemed like five. It was uh, such a pleasant place to be and such a great, great thing to, to be a part of. I know that when someone on the Academy Awards accepts their, their award, and they start naming individual people, they get in trouble because they forget people. On the Golden Globes last week, uh, Ben Affleck forgot to introduce or to thank George Clooney, who was sitting at his own table. So I'm not even gonna try to name individuals that have, that have supported me through my career, but there are just a, a few that, that stand out that I've, I've got to mention. And uh, actually on the way over here, I thought of one more that I, I really needed to tell you about. My first uh, three years at Nichols Junior High, the building was unair conditioned. Uh, it was hot. We started school and gosh, it was hot. And, and the school district, in its infinite wisdom, did give each room a fan. And so you had 25 or 30 bodies and the teacher and a fan. Now we did have windows that opened, it was very nice. And those of you that know me very well know that I don't function well in heat. Uh, and I, I think back, and I think, how in the world did I teach five years at Nichols? There's only three without out air conditioning. But here was the key. And this man, that I don't even know his last name, probably kept me in education. His name was Henry. He was a custodian. And I think it was the second week of school. He came by after school, and I was sitting at my desk and 
sweat running down, and I was grading papers or something, and he came in and said, are you hot? I said, yes, sir, I'm hot. And the next morning, a second fan appeared in my room. <laughs> <clears throat> and if it hadn't been for Henry getting me that fan, probably wouldn't be here today. <laughs> I, uh, I would also like to, to thank former Superintendent Lynn Hale. Um, Miss Hale looked at me in 1993 and she saw who I was and she saw what I'd done and she was able to see beyond that at what I might become and might do and she appointed me as the principal of Arlington High School. And I want to thank Miss Hale. Uh, she changed my life. Uh, I worked for only five principals in my 38 years. Ed Laster was my first principal at, at Nichols Junior High. Uh, Bud Romanzi was my principal at Sam Houston High School. Dr. Doug Schaus hired me at Martin. And Steve Jacoby was my principal at Martin. And each one of those men gave me support and encouragement. They allowed me to do my job. They encouraged me. They, uh, they taught me what leadership of service is all about. But for 10 and a half years of my 38 years, Billy Bob Burdett was my principal. 10 and a half years. I don't know how he did that. I want to thank him for being an outstanding role model. I could not have asked for a better mentor or friend. And as ed any educator can tell you, principals don't really run the school, the secretary does. <laughs> and uh, in Dolores Smith and Helen Isom and Terry Bjorklund, I won the secretary lottery. I never had to worry that things weren't going to be run right. They, they did well and kept my head above the water. I would like to introduce some people who are here with us tonight. I do see a lot of my Arlington High and, and other friends. But uh, these are people that are, that are very special. Uh, I'd like to introduce my family. Uh, Gary Webb, my son-in-law, and his daughter, Hannah. Y'all wave. There you go. And Jennifer Webb, my daughter. And where's the, my other granddaughter? Sydney. Where? Oh, Sydney Webb. <laughs> and Gary teaches at Lamar, and Jennifer is at Mary Moore. My younger daughter, Melissa, who teaches at Short Elementary, and her friend Rob, and her daughters, Peyton and Maddie Kate, and Beckham James, my grandson. <laughs> we also have two members, other members of our family here, uh, Barbara's sister, Judy, and her husband, Glenn McCurley. We appreciate your being here for us. We have neighbors here, our next door neighbor, uh, Diane Tabers and Kimberly are here somewhere. I saw them, there they are. And the people that lived in the house before they moved in next door to us, <laughs> Kelly Hamill Petty. Where are you, Kelly? I saw her in here somewhere. She left. Anyway, Kelly uh, just came in from Kerrville, actually to interview for a job with AISD. She's excellent. <laughs> Don't want to tell you how to do your job, but... Uh, <laughs> We have some special friends here I'd like to, to recognize as well. Uh, next lady I'd like to introduce is uh, she and my wife became friends in kindergarten, and they're still friends. It's amazing. Uh, she is a, a professor at Baylor University, Dr. Mary Ann Jordan. <laughs> Actually, when I started dating Barbara, it's kind of like dating two people. <laughs> Uh, we have had some friends for 46 years who are still our friends, amazingly. Uh, Mike and Sandy Skiles are here. They, we met in Austin many, many years ago. And the last person I'd like to introduce is, is amazing. Uh, he began teaching when I was in seventh grade. We opened a new, uh, new school in, in Midland, Texas called Alamo Junior High, and I think that was his first year to teach. 
He was my high school counselor. He was Barbara's high school assistant principal. He later on worked in as a, in personnel department, I believe, in Katie. Spring Branch. Spring Branch. Anyway, he is he is amazing. He's the kind of person that if you went up to him and said, "Tell me some of the dirty things that you know about James Adams," he could tell you. He's got the stories all up here. <laughs> so, Mr. Stacy, if you want to leave before we before we dismiss here. Finally, I'd like to share one of my favorite quotations. Uh, I've used it many times over the years, and, and teachers at Arlington High have heard it many times. But it's uh, a quotation from John Wooden, the legendary coach at UCLA. When asked why he had become a teacher and a coach, his reply was, where else could I... I choke up on this every time I read it. Where else could I be in such splendid company? Speaking for both of us, I can say that Barbara and I never looked at what we were doing as jobs. AISD was just our way of life. We felt and we feel very lucky to have been able to be a part of the lives of so many amazing people. And we're looking forward to being an active part of the splendid company at Adams Elementary. Thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Adams, if you'll join Ms. Evans to go out to the foyer, we're going to have a reception. And if uh, all of the folks in the audience would just give the board a head start here, we'll go out and we'll give uh, pay our respects to the Adams family. And we will be back in open session in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back in open session. Next item on the agenda is the Career Readiness Certificate Program presentation. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Barron. This evening, uh, we'd like to announce uh, some information about our career and technical education program and opportunities for students. Uh, this semester, we're really focused on the deliverables of our strategic plan. And as you know, our strategic plan includes uh, bold goals for our students to make sure they're college and career ready. And so this semester, we see the demonstration of those uh, goals and the implementation of those goals. And we're, we're starting with the announcement of 10 new certificate programs for career and technical education for students. And so at this time, I'd like to ask Evan Smith, our executive director for secondary instruction, to uh, start our presentation in this exciting announcement of new certificate programs for students to ensure that they're uh, career ready and college ready. Good Evan. evening, President Barron, members of the board, and Dr. Cavazos. I am thrilled and very honored to be up here in front of you to introduce um, this program to you. Um, following the mission of, of, of Arlington ISD right now, I'm going to focus on three of the, uh, on all three of our frameworks for success, the inspired learners, the effective leadership, and the engaged community. Craig Wright and his team have done an amazing job working with Tarrant County Community College to bring these to you this evening. And it's that strong partnership that's going to allow our students for 2013-2014 to be involved in some very exciting and strong programs that are gonna have some life-changing implications for them and their future. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Mr. Craig Wright and his team to you. President Barron and members of the board and Dr. Cavazos, thank you for the time to share with you the work that we've been doing today. Uh, before I got started, I wanted to introduce my team because th this work would not be as successful or done yet if I didn't have the staff to rely on. I'm very, very fortunate. Uh, Debbie Swain is our secretary and she keeps us in line and keeps everybody going and she, like James said, we know who runs the organization. And Ann Miller works with us and has worked with me several years. Ginger Polster also works with us and Tim Thompson. And uh, Beverly Davis works with us, and she's teaching at TCC tonight, so uh, she couldn't be with us. But without them, we really couldn't do the job we do, and they keep me in line. I very much appreciate their work. Uh, tonight, we wanted to share a little bit with you about our progress 
Uh, we had some tasks on the strategic plan, and uh, we have been working diligently. If I could find the right key. Down there, thank you, Mark. I mean, Mark, a great guy. <laughs> a voice from heaven, you know. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, on this slide, I wanted to, a big part of what we're trying to do is create choices for the kids and the parents in Arlington. And we're very excited about that. Um, for our community to understand, we're trying, working to create more opportunities for families and kids. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun as we, in our department, work to do what we can for the kids here. The uh, area I'm going to talk to you today about on our strategic plan is Strategy 2.3, Activity 2. And it was to expand certification programs, our pathways, and enrollment opportunities for our students. And so what we've been doing is working on our kids so that they can leave high school and they can document that they're prepared to go to work. We currently have 15 career certificate programs in Arlington. And as you know, our latest three are the Texas Commission on Fire Protection, the uh, Texas State Emergency Medical Technician, and the Texas Department of Environmental Quality Class D Water Operators License. Those are the newest ones we've gotten started within the last two years. And so we are always looking, part of our operating procedure is to look for courses and certificates that we could teach in our, our courses so that kids leave us and we have documented that we have taught to an industry standard because they've gotten licensure and certification. Tonight we wanted to talk to you about 10 more that we've gotten started this year with our partners at TCC. Uh, they include uh, accounting assistant, auto engine analysis, auto metal repair, business, computer edited drafting and design, computer maintenance, culinary arts, gaming and simulation programming, heating, air conditioning and refrigeration technician, and a basic welding certificate. We, uh, we looked at a range of offerings at TCC and opportunities for us to partner, and these are the ones we felt like had an interest from students and families, and uh, the ones that we could get started. We had uh, time at the TCC schedule here in the middle of the afternoon to take advantage of these, and so in our discussions with TCC, these are the ones that we have worked <coughs> on so far. Uh, accounting assistant, uh, students will earn 16 college credit hours towards an accounting certificate and that certificate lays the foundation for a two-year associate of arts degree in accounting information management or business administration accounting assistant and as they matriculate the program they can decide which pathway that they want to go down. Uh, automotive engine analysis uh, this will prepare students to work with the what they'll study is electrical systems, engineering performance, brake systems, and automotive alternative fuels. And you can see there, they will earn 24 college credit hours towards an associate's degree. Automotive metal repair is uh, another automotive program that we've worked on. The students will learn basic metal principles and working techniques, operation of equipment and procedures involved in the repair of metal body structures. And a special emphasis will be placed on uh, damage analysis on vehicles when they come in. Our uh, business, another business certificate, the uh, students will learn skills that will enable them to demonstrate to an employer their ability and readiness to do the job in business fields such as marketing, merchandising, and real estate. And they can earn up to 22 college credit hours. Our next one is computer-aided design and drafting. And I met one of our local architects at a Chamber of Commerce meeting the other day and visited with him some. These students will use computer-aided drafting software to create the plans and drawings used to construct a building. They will also develop a professional portfolio that will help them stand out when they are interviewing for potential positions. And these students can earn up to 31 college credit hours. Uh, com computer maintenance is our next one. The, this program will introduce students to installation, configuration, and maintenance of micro computer systems. It includes skills in networking fundamentals, terminology, hardware, software, and network architecture, as well as local and wide area networking concepts and networking installations and operations. Culinary arts is another certificate. Uh, these students will be, this program will be preparing students to 
uh, work in the food service industry. Uh, as they matriculate through this program, they could also branch out into nutrition, work in hospitals and uh, long-term care facilities. And these students can earn 15 college credit hours towards a degree. Gaming and simulation programming is another one. These students uh, will prepare students for a career in game, animation, and the graphic arts field. Animation and simulation experts are needed in advertising by marketing agencies, insurance agencies, law firms, and television and video production companies. And these students can earn up to 25 hours towards an associate's degree. Heating and air conditioning technology, we're excited about this one. Did you notice this, Texas? Uh, there's no shortage of need for refrigeration and air conditioning. And these students will learn the skills to install, operate, and troubleshoot HVAC systems. And they will also earn their installation technician certification. So they will all get certification from TCC and also licensure from the state of Texas. Uh, and they can, are instantly employable after they finish these 23 college hours. Now, our goal is to get them to finish the degree. Uh, but we're excited about the opportunity for kids. Uh, it's really unlimited here. And our last one is a basic welding certificate. And these students will be prepared for binding various materials together using more than 90 different welding processes that require a wide range of variety of equipment and skills in today's high-tech industries. These students learn 20 college credit hours towards a degree. And the professors also tell us on this one that they're adults in this program uh, don't tend to finish the degree because there's employers lined up waiting for them to finish this certificate because they're immediately employable and the opportunities in Texas are really booming in those fields. So we would be glad to answer any questions. Try to. I might have to rely on my staff. But any questions you have, we're just excited about the opportunity for kids and enjoy the time to talk to you. Dr. Reich. Uh, thank you, President Barron. Craig and your whole staff, thank you so much for doing this. This is... Uh, uh, something that, that we've dreamt about here as board members. Uh, obviously, with such a focus on college uh, and our focus as a board to make everybody life ready, career ready, uh, this, this is such an amazing catapult of a start. And you. I mean, you guys have done such a great job from here now and moving forward with these programs. It's absolutely phenomenal. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much Thank for that. I, I do have just one question. Do all of these programs typically start their junior year, or is it, are there any that are sooner, or how, how does that Jun work? Junior year, they'll start. Now, we have about three in here that will start the summer after their sophomore year. Okay. So they can get ahead and then junior, senior years. And are they, uh, it's my understanding that this will uh, possibly include about 500 students, is that right? That's our goal. We'll yeah. be able to serve. Phenomenal. 350, 370 this coming school year, uh -huh. and then it will go up as we get a second cohort next year. And then we're still talking. We're still visiting with our friends at TCC, so yeah. we don't expect this to be the end. That's great. So and accept. final question, these are, uh, are they at certain specific campuses, or are these just like the Firefighter Academy where they're able to come from multiple? Some will be on our campuses, and then the, the heavy trades, the specific trades, will be at South Campus. Okay. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. Thank you. Yeah. Mrs. Pena. This is uh, something I wanted to share, I shared with the board members. Um, to show how successful our programs have been, uh, one day I was walking into Walmart and, and I hadn't been able to get a hair appointment by my own hairstylist. So I went into the Walmart area and I sat down and this young girl started working on my hair. And uh, I asked her where she was from and she said Arlington and I asked her, if she enjoyed her job, she said, yes. And I said, well, where did you go to school? She said, Arlington. I said, and how did you get this? She said, high school. I said, so you went to Sam? And she said, well, actually, I went to Arlington High, and I went over for the cosmetology program in Sam Houston. So my hair was done by one of our students. <laughs> good. I'm glad to hear that. Very good. I just want to share that, because she really enjoyed it. She said it was the best thing she ever did. And uh, she's said that she couldn't have done it without the help of our school district. Good. I'm glad to hear that. It's always fun to hear. Mr. Pompa. One of the concerns with uh, these uh, trade schools or trade type of uh, programs is that 
some of the kids that maybe could have gone to college will, will choose to just end up with a certification. And I, I wanted to share the story of the, uh, the stories that we heard when we went to see the Fire Training Academy uh, from parents mm -hmm. uh, as well as from students that uh, shared with us that the program completely changed their lives and their outlook on their lives. Uh, there was a couple of moms that really became emotional telling me about how much the program had changed. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember, how many students are in the senior class right now? 16 left? Yeah, 16. Early. There were 16 students, mm -hmm. and I think every single one of them said that their goal was to actually still go to college, even after, after receiving their uh, certification uh, from the fire department. And some of them can, can actually, well, all of them can actually go to work as, as firefighters. Mm -hmm. But every single one of them said they wanted to continue on uh, and make sure that they received a college uh, degree, a, a bachelor's degree. I don't know that if we get any other 16 kids from the school that every single one of them would say that, but I think that the, the engagement, as we talked about, the, the, the students will, will respond if we engage them in, in classes and courses that are meaningful to them. Um, I think that the maturity uh, that they've developed as part of these programs has uh, completely transformed a lot of these students. And so I know that uh, I'm not concerned about that at all. I think, uh, I think more than anything, it's going to push more students to, to realize that they can accomplish things that maybe they didn't think they could, and uh, they'll go on to actually finish their, their college degrees, and then they'll have lots of options. So thank you very much for these programs. I'm, I'm excited about that. You're welcome. It's been fun with the fire to see. You know, you set the bar, you set the standard, provide support, and the students are capable. It's, it's been very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. That brings us to our appointments. Uh, Dr. Cavazos, do you have some appointments for us? I do. President Barron, thank you. I'd like to recommend the individuals we discussed in closed session for the position of area superintendent for secondary and area superintendent for elementary. Move for approval. Second. Motion by Mr. Hogg, second by Dr. Reich to approve the appointments as covered in closed session. Please vote. All voting in the affirmative. Uh, Mrs. Sullins is traveling for work, so Dr. Cavazos, tell us who you got. Thank you, President Barron. First person I'd like to introduce is our new area superintendent for secondary schools, Ms. Michelle Wilma Senado. <laughs> Michelle received her Bachelor of Arts in Education in 1980 from the University of Dallas Master's of Humanities from the University of Dallas, and then a Master's in Educational Administration from the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, Michelle has, is the, has been the principal of Bowie High School since 2008, has served as a principal of Bowles Junior High, has been an assistant principal at Bowie, an intern at Bowie, and has taught English and Humanities at Bowie and at Arlington High. And she's also has been a lecturer at the University of Texas at Arlington, the College of Education. Uh, very proud to introduce Michelle. Uh, she's she's uh, very focused and driven and uh, will do very well. Uh, Michelle, anybody you'd like to introduce or anything you'd like to say at this time? Thank you, Dr. Cavazos. President Barron, Superintendent Cavazos, members of the Board of Trustees, I want to thank you for this new and exciting opportunity for service. I sought this position because I believe in our district strategic plan, which presents a compelling vision of leadership that is absolutely critical for student achievement. You know, all candidates for principalship come with advanced degrees, they come with multiple certifications, they have experience as classroom teachers, and they have uh, off, uh, experience as an assistant principal prior to receiving their job as the leader of a school. However, sometimes these prior experiences don't prepare us for the challenges of the job which can be overwhelming and so we begin the job with boundless energy and enthusiasm and creativity and very soon we become frustrated and tired and lonely without adequate support 
And so the area superintendent position represents a cultural change in the way our district develops leadership in those of us who need it most. And so in, I want to thank you for your vision in realizing the need for this position and in giving me the opportunity to work with the talented, dedicated secondary school principals in Arlington ISD. I have a couple of people that I would like to introduce tonight that are very special to me. They're my children. They're both adults, and I'm sure they, they really did not like being referred to that way. <laughs> but they're my greatest blessings. My daughter, Anna Sweeney, and my son, Ben Wilmoth. And then I would like to say a, a few words of thanks to some special people. I'd like to, to thank the students, teachers, counselors, staff, and parents of Bowie High School and Bowles Junior High. They were very patient in, as I learned how to be a principal. I'd like to say a special thank you to my administrative team at Bowie High School. Bill Manley, Dean of Instruction, and Assistant Principals Ray Borden, Vernetta Burkhalter, Iris Clinton, Keith Johnson, Katura Madison, Michelle Trussell, and Jeannie Paul Turner. I want to thank them for the commitment that they have to getting better every day. This is the kind of relentless focus on improvement that will be necessary for AISD to implement our bold strategic plan and become a premier district. Thank you. Next person I'd like to introduce is our uh, area superintendent for elementary schools, and that is Dr. Melissa Hobrick. <laughs> Dr. Hobrick received her uh, Bachelor of Arts from the University of Texas in San Antonio, her Master of Arts from the University of Mary Hardin Baylor, and her doctorate in educational leadership from Tarleton State University. Dr. Hobrick has uh, most recently been the Director of Elementary Personnel. She's been the Principal of Ferguson Junior High School. She's been the Principal of Piercy Elementary. She's also worked in Belton ISD as a Principal at an elementary school, an Assistant Principal, and a teacher. And she's also taught at Colleen ISD and has worked as an adult uh, counseling, counselor. Um, Dr. Hobrick uh, is, is also very focused and very driven on improvement, and it's my pleasure to introduce her uh, Dr. Harbrick, is there anything you'd like to say or anybody you'd like to introduce? Yes, thank you. President Barron, Dr. Cavazos, and members of the board, I want to thank you for this opportunity. This opportunity that educators work their entire career to obtain. Each campus that I have had the pleasure to be assigned to, the teachers, the staff at both Pearson and Ferguson, the personnel department, elementary principals, and the, the Lamar cluster, challenged me as an educator. I pushed each campus teacher or principal to excel. And in return, they pushed me to be the best that I could be. That's how we grow and that's how we continue to grow. As an area superintendent, this position presents the opportunity to work side by side with campus principals, examining data, observing teacher and students in, this, in the instructional process, collaborating to determine the best deliveries of instruction. It's an effort that will ensure that we have the most effective instructional leaders and teachers and that every student will be academically successful. These positions will assist in meeting our goals defined in the strategic plan, inspiring learners and effective leadership. I am absolutely thrilled that I will be part of this process. I would like to thank the staff at Piercy and Ferguson, and all the elementary principals, all that I have learned from them as an educator. To the personnel department and Ms. Evans, thank you for all your support and all the training in the few months that I've been there. <laughs> and lastly, thank you, Dr. Cavazos, for this opportunity and the vote of confidence, and to you, the board. Thank you very much. I am ready to start and I am thrilled. Um, I do have family members 
Uh, my daughter just returned from Afghanistan is in Hawaii. She just returned Wednesday. She couldn't be here. Hi, Lindsay, they're watching. I'm so excited. <laughs> and also my son is in Korea. Hi, Aaron. Uh, so he's watching as well. And then I have one more at home, my youngest, David. <laughs> they are my biggest supporters and I am theirs. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And Dr. Harbrick and Michelle, if you'll follow Ms. Evans out to the front, we will have a receiving line. And once again, I'll ask the audience to give the board a head start. We will go through the receiving line and be right back in. This time, five minutes, folks. <laughs> five minutes. Now we come to our open forum for agenda items. This is a routine part of the school board's agenda for regularly scheduled meetings. This section of the meeting provides citizens with an opportunity to share their views with the trustees on items that are on the agenda tonight. It is not intended to be a discussion or a debate and the trustees will not reply to the speakers. Derogatory comments aimed at an individual will not be tolerated. Personnel matters are not appropriate subjects for the open forum. I have two cards from the audience this evening. When your name is called, please step to the podium. You will have five minutes to speak. A lighted timer on the podium will assist you in pacing your presentation. A yellow light will illuminate when there is one minute remaining. And when the red light comes on and the buzzer sounds, please end your presentation. First card tonight is from uh, Robert Morrison. His subject is campus security. Evening, Mr. Morrison. Good evening. I'm here tonight to discuss the school's responsibilities to protect our children and our educators, specifically making a fundamental change in the board's approach and allowing educators their option to carry a concealed handgun to school to protect themselves and our students. There are good guns and there are bad guns. We all, we all know who the bad guns are, the ones in the hands of the mass murderers, thugs, and others that would do harm. Good guns are in the hands of responsible citizens. They protect our elected officials, our money, our property, commercial buildings, our homes, our streets, our celebrities, our armored trucks, even our school board meetings. Officer Hampton is here tonight for our protection. The point is that guns are good and used everywhere to protect our people, our stuff, and our money. Then why are guns looked upon so bad when we want to use them to protect our most valuable asset and precious children? Money and stuff can be replaced, but children can't. I served in the, in the military during the Cold War, and what got us through the Cold War without a major conflict was a policy called deterrence and power projection. We projected that we were so strong <clears throat> and powerful that no one would challenge us or they'd be annihilated. I suggest that the school district use the same concept to keep any would-be thug from assaulting our schools. These cowards would have to deal with the possibility of facing armed resistance instead of totally defenseless targets. I would like to discuss a couple of quick examples. Are y'all familiar with Sidwell Schools for Friends? It's a single campus school district in Washington, D.C., and they maintain 11 guards at all times to protect their students. Something a little closer to home is Herald ISD, northwest of Wichita Falls. They've been highly publicized as a school district that have allowed any or all of their student, or the, excuse me, their um, administrators and teachers 
to carry weapons to school. In the last five years that this has been the policy, there's been no instances of schools in the district. I talked to Superintendent David Tweet about his district and he provided quite a bit of information, but keeping with deterrence and power projection, he wouldn't divulge specifics. Right now we're paying as an ISD about $1,080 a day for hall monitors. Okay, that's about uh, $237,000 a year for hall monitors. That money could be applied if the school board wanted to, to pay for CHL classes for teachers and administrators. And that would result in 1,584 armed teachers that have a vested interest in protecting themselves and our children. That could be up to 23 potential armed guards to act as the first line of defense. Even better than using AISD funds to pay for it, Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst last Friday announced that he's in favor of the state paying for robust handgun training for our teachers and administrators. And Governor Rick Perry has announced that he supports all CHL holders to be able to carry their guns anywhere without restriction. I just know I'd rather read a headline that said, heroic Arlington principal stops a mass murderer instead of the headlines we're all dealing with where 26 innocent people lost their lives to an unstable 20-year-old punk in Sandy Hook Elementary. The Gun-Free Zone Act, the Nickleby Act, and the Texas Penal Code all have provisions that grant the school districts power to allow teachers and administrators to be approved to, con to carry concealed handguns on campus. Another major thing that needs to be done is take down the Gun-Free Zone signs. All they do is advertise to every insane killer in America that schools are the safest place to inflict maximum mayhem with minimum risk. Instead, publicize that Arlington ISD, in order to protect our staff and our students, has authorized administrators and teachers that are legally licensed to carry a concealed weapon to do so. Whether there's one or 50 staff members armed at any one school, the insane, cowardly killer will twi think twice before attacking. <clears throat> Tonight you have the power and the responsibility to do everything you can to protect our schools. I believe your authorization for teachers and staff to carry a concealed weapon to school will be a major step in assuring that a school in Arlington, Texas does not become the next Sandy Hook. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. Our next speaker is Mr. Luis Castillo. His subject is uh, to consider campus security infrastructure. Evening, Mr. Castillo. Good evening, President Barron, distinguished board members, Dr. Cavazos, and staff. My name is Luis Castillo. I'm here as a community stakeholder to uh, offer a two-point plan uh, regarding security at elementary schools. Now, be before I do that, I'd like to add some uh, qualifiers here. You know, I'm a, I'm a former police officer. I don't know whether some of you know that I did almost 10 years as a police officer, a street cop. And uh, it, it is one thing to be licensed to carry a handgun, and it's another to go after someone who has a gun. Not everybody's cut for that. You know, I've been in those situations where I had to chase or confront a person with a handgun. And believe me, not everybody's cut for that. Even though they may have a license to carry a weapon, you know, it's, an, it's a whole different ball of wax, you know, when you have someone pointing a gun at you. So I'm not very uh, supportive of arming our teachers. And I think there's less drastic ways that we can address the issue by being proactive, being uh, preventive, uh, taking preventive measures. You know, uh, another thing I'd, I'd like to mention here is for the purpose of this short presentation, uh, when I make reference to uniform law officers or peace officers, I'm talking about City of Arlington police officers, Tarrant County constables, sheriff deputies, and Texas the Department uh, troopers. Uh, the first uh, point in, in this proposal for your consideration is uh, the goal number one, increase uniform law enforcement presence at elementary schools without the high cost associated with police. 
And what this initiative calls for is going to cost zero dollars. But what it's going to cost is for us to be creative. We need to think of ways of bringing law enforcement officers to the campuses. Uh, for example, we can have the uh, principal or staff invite police officers for lunch or breakfast. We want a uniformed police officer there, police car in the front, or deputy or constable in the front to serve as a deterrent. Because uh, we all know that, you know, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure that you all have seen those uh, lookout towers in, in the mall or somewhere, police. You don't want to see a thief or a criminal trying to commit a crime in the presence of that. Police officer right here, she's working. She's offering deterrent. You have another police officer in the front. You know, so, so the whole idea between this initiative is to find ways to bring law enforcement officers to the campuses. Uh, one is, like, like I mentioned, you know, have them uh, uh, take some an appreciation lunch or breakfast and have those police officers uh, show up. Have students write essays to the police or peace officers invite them to, to come and visit their schools. Or have staff invite uh, the peace officers to come and do a presentation on their jobs or ro their role in the community. Anything that will bring up peace officers to the campus that, that will show some visibility of law enforcement in the campus will be an improvement, more so than right now. Right now, elementary schools don't have uh, police officers. You know, we do uh, have police officers, I believe, in middle schools and junior highs. But the important is, thing here is deterrence. Uh, the other day I was passing through this school uh, and that has a, almost a middle school that has a SRO, a police officer, and I noticed that the police car was parked in the back of the building. I took the time to stop, looked up the officer, and, and we talked, and I said, look, I know that you might have a reason for parking in the back, but it's a self-defeating purpose. If you park the vehicle in the back, we want it in the front for people to know that there's police. Probably uh, initially, the idea of having police officers on campus was to maintain the peace in, in the, in the uh, schools, but also we need to look at the flip side, that it, the presence of a, a police car in the front creates a deterrence. You know, uh, maybe the bad guys will decide to go somewhere else. You know, we, we just never know. We live in, in a society where, you know, uh, on, on uncertainties. Uh, another thing is to uh, have a, adopt a school by the community police officers. Uh, another initiative will be to uh, initiate a school wash program, just like the uh, neighborhood wash. Those uh, residents that live within the proximity of the school to, uh, to be in the lookout, report any suspicious activities. And, and the second goal is to increase vigilance and security at elementary schools at a minimal cost. In this regard, I'm asking the board to consider hiring 60 campus monitors for the elementary schools. And those campus monitors will serve as the eyes and ears of the campus. You know, some school districts have campus monitors at, at elementary schools, and, th and they play a, a, a security role. And they will get to know the community, and they'll be on the lookout for any suspicious activity. Uh, for this 60 uh, campus monitors, you know, for annual costs, including benefits and supplies and training, is projected to be $2.5 million. I don't think that's a whole lot asking for protecting our children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Castillo. And that concludes our open forum. <laughs> Brings us to our action items. The first action item is to consider a charge to the 2013-14 Financial Futures Committee. Mr. Drollinger. Oh. Ms. Powell. Cindy. Mr. Murray. They closed the laptop. I'm looking for people to do it. Okay. President Barron, board members, Dr. Cavazos, good evening. Uh, it's hard to believe, but we are back at the time of year where we're already starting to talk about budget and about preparing next year's budget. Uh, so each year at this time, um, we talk about appointing a financial futures committee uh, to review the budget and make uh, recommendations to the board for that budget. 
Uh, our Financial Futures Committee has existed in various forms since 1992. It previously was called the Citizens Budget Review Committee, and over the years it has provided very valuable input to um, the board for uh, preparation of the upcoming general fund budget. Uh, we have drafted a um, charge. Uh, we submitted that to the board FFC liaison committee and Mr. Papa and Mrs. Pena are on that committee as well as Ms. Sullins and they, um, uh, Mr. Papa, do you want to comment on the charge itself? Sure, um, I can comment on, on a couple of items on the charge. We recognize that uh, there wasn't a whole uh, lot of need for change, so the charge is for the most part the same. There was a couple of items that we removed because we didn't feel like we still needed to continue to look at the uh, MGT um, recommendations since, since we were through with those, we removed that. Uh, we added the uh, review and discuss the strategic plan to make sure that everyone that serves on the committee is well acquainted <clears throat> with um, with uh, more of the details of the strategic plan. I think every, everyone probably on that committee has seen it, but uh, we'll get, give them a little bit uh, more in-depth uh, understanding of that. Um, a little bit of a review on staffing and, and, and class selection protocol. And then uh, we added a one bullet point towards the bottom for to get some feedback uh, from the community through the Futures Finance, uh, Financial Futures Committee on our uh, natural gas fund. Uh, I know that that committee is going to, uh, the board committee is going to be working on that, so we thought that would be a good um, avenue to, to receive uh, community input. So those are the, the main three changes on, on, the, on the charge for this year. And I, I'll just very, very briefly run through these. Uh, the particular work product that uh, the board has as a draft for the charge contains the items that you see on the screen. And as Mr. Papa said, uh, we would ask the committee to look at various sources of data, internal and external, to help understand their impact, the what drives our budget. And then certainly to have a, a good understanding of the strategic plan, because that uh, shapes very much everything we do with our budget. Um, and then the staffing methods uh, and also uh, to review the current general operating budget to understand again what drives it uh, and then looking at expenditures uh, by department uh, and program uh, to identify if there's any opportunities to make any changes or savings um, or uh, defer any expenditures. And then also we would again um, identify and potentially prioritize uh, recommended expenditures from the natural gas fund for the future for the board's consideration. And then the committee will make its report uh, to the board on April 18th. So that's, uh, those are the bulleted points within the, the work charge for the committee. Mr. Hibbs. Thank you, President Barron. Um, Ms. Powell, um, as, for the identify and prior, prioritize uh, by majority vote the, um, uh, the district's natural gas fund, um, did this come out of committee with that recommendation that we take this to the FFC? Because we'll, we're still working on that, uh, um, on a draft for the board. And I think it may be a little bit premature to bring it to the FSC committee if the um, uh, board's F, uh, natural gas fund uh, committee has not yet uh, brought that, or, you know, or recommendations to the entire board to look at. Uh, I'm not sure about the timing, Mr. Hibbs. Uh, this is, it is the last bullet point that we plan on addressing each of these in that order. Uh, we may not be addressing this towards the later part of our meetings, but again, and I, and I also know from uh, uh, Ms. Powell that the staff is also working on, 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 on some recommendations, I believe, maybe that's with, with your committee. Okay. And so if the timing isn't appropriate, then I'm okay with striking it off. Uh, we were just looking at this in terms of uh, community input for uh, what, how to use those resources. Right. I, I definitely uh, believe that uh, we need to go out to community input on it. 
the board uh, committee, and, and Ms. Sullins is the chair, um, Mr. Hogg also serves on it. Uh, we've actually been contact with, uh, contacted by some other entities uh, that would look at, like to talk to us about uh, prioritizing uh, these funds, maybe working with uh, some other foundations such. Um, I just think that we're a little bit premature in having that discussed because it may be in a totally different direction than what the board will uh, want to move on. Well, and, and Ms. Ms. Sullins chairing that committee, she is the one that recommended this, uh, this bullet point for this particular okay. charge. Uh, she's not here, so I, I communicated with her before to make sure that this was the way she, she was okay with wording it. But. Mr. Hogg? I think my concern is, is the wording in there. Um, it makes it seem like we're just spending that natural gas fund. I, I think the purpose and intent of us bringing this before that committee is to say, here's some of the things we're looking at. Wh which one sits with the community is, is just some community feedback to how we do it. So maybe if we just tweak the words, because I think it is a good idea for us to say, here's what we've progressed, here's where we're going, because it's not so easy. You know, we had many uh, discussions with our financial advisors of what you can invest in, how you can do it, for those type of things. It, it's a, definitely not as simple as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> On, on making some of those decisions. So I think if we just kind of maybe right. word swoop, smith that a little bit, because when I read that, it's automatically saying, how are you going to spend the natural gas fund? And that's a little concern for mine. So I think it's just a little, little rewording for that to say, because there are a lot of rules and some parameters we, we need to set on that natural gas I would, fund. I would concur with Mr. Hogg on that. Um, I may be doing a poor job here in communicating what Ms. Solomon okay. was looking for. We, we've got the right intent now. Let's just... Let's word, wordsmith it, because when I read that first, I said, whoa, what? I know that was a change on, on adding that bullet in. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's yeah. a little, hey, here's your gas fund, just spend it, which I, don't, right. I, I do I, not agree with that. I would all. like to see maybe instead of it being um, a recomm uh, recommending uh, uh, future expenditures with it, uh, that the, that hopefully, uh, within the next month or so, the um, natural gas uh, committee will be able to craft um, uh, suggestions for this fund, and then maybe we can put those um, in front of the uh, committee to say, um, does this make sense to you? basically allow them to look at it? But um, yeah, it, to recommend uh, future expenditures of it, uh, I don't think we have a good grasp on it yet. Yeah, and this is something that would probably, we're, we're, our, fir, our very first meeting is going to be at the beginning of February. Yes. Um, more than likely, if we do get to that bullet point, again, we're, our plan is to go in order that they're listed here. So um, if we do get to that, it may be sometime mid-March to okay. mid, mid to later March. So. You think there's a potential of being able to... Um, have it listed um, under the FFC charge uh, uh, that the board would um, bring um, current ideas, uh, uh, possible uses um, at a future date, uh, or the district will review this depending if whether or not we're finished. Um, you know, I think that it might be safer to say uh, the district will review uh, the natural gas fund with the FSC committee, and they would be in some way of wordsmithing, and I'm not very good with this, um, share possible options. I think Mr. Hogg's already got it figured out. Well, I'm working on it. Keep talking. Okay. Keep talking. Keep talking. I've talked out, so I mean. Keep talking. Stretch, stretch, stretch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I okay. could make a suggestion. Okay. And, okay. And I don't, you I'm just, open for others. Uh, something along the lines of uh, review and discuss uh, future financial plans of the district's natural gas fund. I'm comfortable with that. I, that's, that's even better than what I wrote, so I'm all for it. You want me to repeat? I'm sorry. Uh, it, Review and discuss 
future financial plans of the districts or for the district's uh, natural gas fund? Yeah, I'm perfectly fine with it. I think it's broad enough and I think Ms. Sullins will. Yeah, and I think that's what Ms. Sullins was looking for to for them to give you feedback on the work that you guys are planning on doing in your committee. I think that's what she was looking for. So I think we'll, I think that'll work. That change. Um, if with that, if there's no more questions, I can make a motion. Yeah, I don't need a second. Now, before I make a motion, there is there's one thing that I wanted to address, and we had um, I had two calls from teachers expressing interest in serving in this committee, and no less than four teachers that applied to this committee. And up to now, it's been um, uh, the tradition, I guess, in essence, that uh, the teachers that are, are allowed to serve are allowed to serve through either any of the associations. Uh, but I think it's something that we may be reconsidering in the future. So teachers that are interested in serving, um, we couldn't do it this particular uh, cycle because the charger was already out there on, on the web. We didn't want to change it midstream, but uh, it is something that we're going to be reconsidering for the future. So just uh, don't lose interest. Please continue to express interest in, in, in this uh, important committee. With that, I, I move to approve the individuals recommended for membership. Oh, the, are we doing the? That, that's the. Just the charge. That's just the charge. Okay. Well, then I'll make, make a motion to approve the charge as amended uh, by, by the board. Thank you. Coming out of committee, we don't need a second. Is there any further discussion? Please vote on the charge. All present voting in the affirmative. The charge passes. Thank you. Next on the agenda is to consider the appointment of the 2013-14 Financial Futures Committee. Oh, Tony is Mr. Pompa, not Mr. Now I get it. Mr. Pompa. <laughs> Earlier today, we finalized the, the slate and we emailed it uh, to the committee and I believe it was emailed to the rest of the board. So uh, I would move, move that we approve the individuals recommended for membership on the 2013-2014 Financial Futures Committee and to give, the authority, uh, give authority to the board Financial Futures Committee liaison committee that's a mouthful. To make additional appointments of eligible applicants as needed for a total of 25 Financial Futures Committee members. We're not at 25, and we don't have two representatives from every uh, cluster. So we're still working on making sure that we get at minimum two representatives from every cluster. And so that's the, the last part of the, of the recommendation of the motion. Do we have the list of names? Uh, did we send it out to everyone? Do we want to print one out? Mr. Murray, can you help us post the list? I don't have that. Okay, we we need to we need to get the revised list, Mark. So just we'll we'll get a revised list here in just a second. We have a motion from the committee to accept this list that's on the screen now as the uh, committee members for the 2013-2014 FFC. Sir. Coming from committee, we do not need a second. Is Mr. there any Papa, discussion on the are list? You going to Discuss the additional appointments potentially. Mr. Papa, did everybody understand that part of the motion is to give us the authority to make additional appointments? Because as you can see up there, we only have one representative from Bowie, one from Sam Houston, and one from uh, Seguin. We'd like to have a minimum of two from each of those campuses. 
That's part of the motion. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Pomp, would you also consider that if you need to replace any of these committee members with alternates, I think the committee should have the designation to do that. Thank you. I appreciate it, sir. Okay. Please vote. Thank you. All present voting in the affirmative. And Mrs. Payne, you had to step out. Thank you. We have a committee. Could I just insert that just for the record mm -hmm. that the two brewers for Martin High School are not, uh, they're not family or anything? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hibbs. The next item on the agenda is to consider the order of trustee election. I need a motion to call a trustee election for May 11th, 2013. Move to call an election for May 11th, 2013. Second. Motion by Mr. Hogg, second by Mr. Pompano. Call an election for May 11th of 2013. I will read the order of election. A general election is hereby ordered to be held Saturday, May 11th, 2013 for the purpose of electing members to the Board of Trustees of the Arlington Independent School District to fill place numbers four and five. The main early voting polling site for all voters residing in the Arlington Independent School District, including the portion of the district that lies within the City of Arlington, the City of Dow Worthington Gardens, the Tarrant County portion of the City of Grand Prairie, and the Town of Pantego will be the following location. Tarrant County Election Center, 2700 Premier Street, Fort Worth, Texas, 76111. Between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., Monday through Friday, beginning April 29th, 2013, through May 7th, 2013. Between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. on Saturday, May 4th, 2013. Between the hours of 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. on Sunday, May 5th, 2013 and between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. on Monday and Tuesday, May 6th and 7th, 2013. Applications for a ballot by mail for voters residing in the Arlington Independent School District shall be mailed to Steve Rayborn, Early Voting Clerk, Post Office Box 961011, Fort Worth, Texas, 761610011. Applications for a ballot by mail must be received no later than the close of business on Friday, May 3rd, 2013. The order of election may be amended at a later date to include early voting sites added or deleted due to joint elections with other political subdivisions issued this 17th day of January, 2013. Next item on the agenda is to consider the Board of Trustees meeting calendar change. And this is on page 15 of your book. Oh, we have to vote on the... Okay. You know, if you don't want to, since no, it's my have, term it's coming your up. Election, we... <laughs> so you... I think we had a motion. Let's go ahead and vote. I know. All voting in the affirmative, we will have an election in May. Thank you. Who's running besides Mr. Hibbs? Ms. Sullins. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the trustees meeting calendar change. Page 15 on your book, please.
think so. Uh, the recommended change is to change the February 21st work session to Monday, February 25th. Any comments from the board on that? Mr. Hogg? Mr. Barron, I would ask that we make sure we notify our uh, student leader advisory board. That is a scheduled time. Um, when they, we usually have a work session with them before to have the first hour, two hours to discuss with our students and receive student feedback. Um, so we need to make sure we notify those students also that we are changing that day. And I'll make the motion to make that change. That is the only change to the calendar, to change the uh, work session on February 21st to February 25th. Second. Motion by Mr. Barron, second by Mr. Hibbs to change the date on the calendar. Please vote. All members present voting in the affirmative. We have a calendar change, and we'll go ahead and notify the slab. Thank you. Takes us to our discussion action items. We're going to make one little change here. We're going to take action item, discussion action item B and take it first. This is to consider the RFQ for stakeholder surveys and related training. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Barron. And uh, the surveys that uh, we're bringing forward tonight, the, the uh, recommendations, are part of our strategic plan. And uh, part of that is to obtain feedback for improvement from all aspects, including our employees. Uh, our employers and uh, our students and, and, and staff. And so at this time, I'd like to ask Ms. Powell to come up and uh, introduce the item uh, for our consideration. Mr. President Barron, board members, Dr. Cavazos. Um, as Dr. Cavazos just said, within our strategic plan, we have uh, goals for several things, including workplace culture and customer service, career and college readiness, and parent family engagement and customer service. All those are embedded in different components within the strategic plan. Um, our plan is to do surveys of various populations to give us data to help develop these programs, these initiatives, and then measure what current realities are, move from there then uh, to address those realities and make improvements and implement uh, the goals, of, reach the goals of our strategic plan. The, District issued a, an RFP for these services, or an RFQ, rather, and we have obtained uh, qualification statements from three different firms. We have representatives from each of those firms here this evening uh, to make presentations on the particular uh, surveys that we are recommending that they be awarded. There are actually five surveys that uh, we have issued the RFQ for. And uh, I'm going to, I think the easiest way to do this is maybe one at a time for the, uh, the, the different firms as they come up. Uh, we have two surveys. One is the employee survey and leadership training. And another is the parent and family surveys. And both of those we are recommending be awarded to a uh, student group, student education. And so with us this evening, we have Janice, uh, Janet Pilcher and Robin Lergu. And they are here all the way from Florida to visit with us this evening, make a brief presentation about their firm and uh, the particular surveys and the training work that they will do associated with those surveys. President Barron, Dr. Cavazos, and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. I'm gonna make a short presentation and then I'll entertain any questions that you have. Uh, I'm Janet Pilcher. I'm the senior leader of the education division of Studer Group. Um, there's a one-pager at your seat that gives you a couple paragraphs, that a, a description of Studer Group and Studer Education, and then um, some slides of the team of individuals who will be working on this project. Uh, Studer Group is, uh, is a, a company that 
has mainly been involved in building excellence in healthcare organizations. Uh, it was founded by uh, Quint Studer, and he introduced an evidence-based leadership framework for building excellence in hospitals. Several years ago, he connected with me as an educator, and we started an education division to take some of those best practices from the medical field and begin to apply them in education. So um, we, um, Dr. Dr. Larg is here with me. She is represents mainly the practitioner focused of our team. Um, she is a longstanding educator, a teacher, principal, and uh, director in a school district. Um, I started as a teacher and spent 20 years in higher education at the University of West Florida, uh, one of those um, areas as a dean of a college of education and then left um, to join the student group to work at specifically in schools. And we also have as part of our team, Dr. Julie Councilman, who is uh, a great researcher. So we, the three of us make up the team. What I wanted to do is just introduce you um, to a couple of slides to give you an overview of our framework and then specifically talk about the surveys. Uh, the evidence-based leadership process uh, is aligns very specifically to the strate a strategic plan. So you all have done great work in the area of building a, your vision and goals in a strategic plan. Uh, what, what we then do is look at that strategic plan and then begin to build the measures, the goals and measures in form of a district scorecard. And so some of the survey work that we will be looking at and getting the results will be placed into that district scorecard so that we can see where baseline measures are, look at where growth where growth areas are and then look at where the gaps are for, for leadership development. Um, we also, um, as part of the work that we do with school districts, we're currently working with six partner school districts. We've been very strategic and very selective in that process because we want to see good successes. But part of that process is then to um, align leader evaluations. The board sets the goals, the superintendent <coughs> evaluation is aligned to those goals and from that superintendent evaluation those evaluations then cascade down to the district level and then to the principals and departments. So there's goal alignment as well as evaluative alignment. And then we look at from the survey work and the results and the data that comes in from student achievement, for example, um, we then look at where the gaps are and then focus our leader development on those gaps. So it's a very aligned process um, when we work with districts. In particular with with the work that we responded to in the RFQ, we will be, um, we had, we asked to be considered for the development and implementation and execution of an employee engagement, parent satisfaction, and what we call a district services support card. Um, we have surveys in these particular areas that we're implementing in the six school districts. We've created reliability studies and have very high reliability attached to those instruments. And we also have some benchmarking data. So one of the advantages of using some of the items in the surveys is we can begin to benchmark against some of the other districts as well as comparative data, just more for your information than anything else. So. We, would, we had recommended that we start with that as a development process. We start with those surveys and then add any items that would be unique and specific to Arlington Independent School District. The employee engagement is the extent to which um, the, the employees believe that their leaders provide a work environment that gives them the opportunity to reach their highest potential. So employees and teachers have input into that process. Parent satisfaction is just what it says. It's how the extent to which parents are satisfied with their child's education. And the third area is a district services support card, which is the extent to which school leaders are satisfied with the district services that are provided at the district office. So those are the particular items that we've responded to and would be honored to work with your district to implement. I take any questions. Dr. Rice. Thank you, President Barron. Uh, thank you for the information. Uh, I, I wanna make sure that I understand everything. The, the, the leader development uh, part of that table is not anything that you'll be providing that that's 
you'll be providing the framework for what that development's going we, to be. We will be providing the development. You will be doing that. So when we okay. identify, we have a we have a modules that we've developed and we offer the leader development, okay. and we we use the survey data to determine where the highest needs are, and then we'll do offer that development. Oh, okay, great. Yes. And then, uh, can you can you tell us what the uh, what the other six districts are that that you work with, and the more budget. specifically as far as benchmarking for our district, are are there any any similarities, or what would be the dissimilarities as far as benchmarking us to these districts? Yeah, the ones that are most similar to you are uh, Charleston County School District in South Carolina, Escambia County School District in Florida, and Oklahoma City Public Schools. Those districts have close enough demographics that we could begin to benchmark. The other districts, we um, have um, another district in Florida um, that uh, in, in size, it's a little bit smaller, but the demographics don't quite align. Um, and then we have a, a smaller, two smaller districts, and one in Wisconsin and one in Michigan, Janesville, Wisconsin, and Jackson, Michigan. Okay. So we can still look at those benchmarking mark, but they are there as districts are in the Midwest, they're relatively small. And as far as where you are with the process uh, with those districts, uh, they've you've already gone through this whole process with them, yeah. and you're continuing to do more developmental uh, yeah. related items with yeah. them. Yeah, we're we're somewhere in between um, the end of one year to the end of four years in the process of working with those districts. So we've gradually been adding districts um, to the work that we do. Uh, and really looking at that entire evidence-based leadership model for the for the it really builds a culture of transformation because it helps people really look at a district scorecard, look at the goals and measures, and really align their actions and behaviors and execute consistently. And so I, I would assume then, with that multi-year track record, you're able to track that cultural transformation in those districts we then have, as well. Yeah, we've been very fortunate. Good. I could show you, you know, several slides for, for each of them where we've looked at improvements and Good. our key drivers are student achievement, employee engagement, parent satisfaction, and finance. Those are our key pillars that we think are essential. Could be others, but those are essential components of, you know, what every school district really focuses on. Final question. Uh, with, with this engagement, this is, uh, is this the, the first round, the first year, and then we would be looking at additional year contracts? Yeah, we, we normally, um, when we are working with the evidence-based leadership model, we, we look really at a three-year process. Okay. Um, the first year is setting the baseline data, doing the initial leader development, and, and then um, getting leader evaluations set in place. And then and then the second two years are really fulfilling, you know, moving that out to look at consistent growth across the time. Across time. And is the the additional uh, years costs are they similar to this first year? Are they lower, higher? Yeah, Can you give us any information? We, we've done at this point. We basically have, you know, it's just a consistent cost for the three year period because the time and effort has been the same. Okay. Um, I mean, that's the we we've, we've been. Um, it's, it, we really want to put the time and effort into it because it, we, we want to see improvement in school districts and really work as a partner in that process. Yeah. That's the way we see our role. Very good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Papa. Dr. Pilcher, yes. good to see you again. You too. Uh, it was several months ago, I guess, that we had our first conversation about uh, probably even more than this. I, I think this is just the beginning of it, uh, and I know right. there's a lot more to what mm -hmm. your group has to offer, and I do want to uh, say thank you to Dr. Carter and to Ms. Jamie Sullins for um, kind of sourcing you guys out and saying there is a, an organization out there that is already working on uh, kind of culture uh, realignment mm -hmm. of culture, and so we visited with uh, Robert Early from JPS, uh, mm. John Peter Smith, who is recognized as driving a new culture of service mm -hmm. and performance at John Peter Smith Hospital, and he couldn't say enough good things about you. He volunteered to come speak at, at one That's of the board great. meetings, and so uh, that was just a reaffirmation of what we already kind of expected from the product that you guys uh, bring. So I'm thrilled that we're here. I'm thrilled that, uh, that, that that little seed that was planted back then has, has continued to grow. A couple of questions. Uh, just clarification, this is not okay. your full program. This is just the beginning of it, correct? 
That's correct. I mean, our, our uh, we, you know, we want to partner in doing the, the, the work and the evidence-based leadership piece um, because um, with the conversations that we've had with you and Ms. Sullins and Dr. Cavazos, I just think your, your school district is um, set to do wonderful things. And so we really look, as I mentioned, we're selective with partners um, because our goal is really to take model school districts and try to move them forward. Um, so uh, I, we want, our, our motivation is really to engage in this with you. And one of the things that I really liked, especially from the leadership perspective, is, is uh, developing a framework uh, that is transparent, that mm -hmm. sets clear, realistic, and reasonable expectations of everyone and uh, then there, there's accountability uh, yes. with that framework. Uh, and so I'm really excited about that. So uh, mainly I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Carter and to Ms. Sullins for int introducing your organization to, to, to our school Absolutely. board. Absolutely, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pelcher. Thank you thank very you. much. The, uh, the next survey, again, as I mentioned earlier, there are five for which we put out an RFQ. Are we voting on each individual contract or as a group? The RFQ was put out as a single item, RFQ, and so out of that we are recommending uh, three different firms to do the five uh, different surveys and the training that goes with those. So um, typically we would make one vote to award to all. Even though they're separate contracts? They will be, yes. Okay. And similar, we do that with, you know, a number of bids we have have multiple vendors and we vote one vote to award all. <clears throat> the, uh, the next uh, survey that we want to talk about is the one for, um, there are two, uh, a graduate survey, which would be the graduates of the 2012 class, class of 2012 last year, and an employer survey. Uh, that is a survey that uh, would assess uh, local employers' perceptions of the readiness of AISD graduates to move into the workplace. For those two surveys, the district is recommending Raymond Turco and Associates to conduct the surveys and provide uh, action plans. So and we have with us this evening, Ray Turco. So he will make a brief presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cavazos and the red one. I am Ray Turco with Raymond Turco and Associates and I'm very pleased to talk to you about the two surveys that we've been selected for, the uh, class of 2012 senior exit survey and the employer survey of former AISD uh, students. Just to talk a little bit about our firm, uh, we believe that we are exceptionally experienced. Uh, we've had the opportunity to work here in the Arlington School District for going on nearly 30 years in various survey projects. Uh, we use a very proven approach and methodology that we have used in previous efforts. Uh, we have experience with the two projects that we will be working on, uh, and we have had an enduring commitment to the school district. The two firms that are going to be working together is myself, Raymond Turk and Associates, and Pavlik and Associates. Uh, we've had a working relationship since 1982. Again, uh, the first survey that I was involved with the school district here was in 19. Uh, 83, which was after the first and only bond election that was defeated. Uh, our firm was brought in at the time, so I've been working with the school district on a multitude of surveys. Uh, we've worked for school districts uh, throughout the state, and then our lo we are local. Uh, my office is seven and a half miles from here, and uh, Linda's office is in downtown Fort Worth. Uh, we want to talk about the research components that we'll be using. Uh, we will work with the staff and we will work with the other consultants so that we have an instrument that in both instances that works to address the objectives of the comprehensive plan. We're going to use a contact methodology uh, in both instances of online participation. 
We're going to use, utilize the design that allows us to have thorough tabulations and analysis of the projects, and then analyses that provide a full understanding of the subsets that are surveyed. When we look at the 2012, class of 2012, we have been involved previously in surveying uh, high school seniors here in AISD. Uh, we've used online surveys. We, in the past, have done it uh, in an initial graduating class, then after 18 months, and then after five years. Uh, in this particular instance, we will be looking at the class of 2012. I'm not sure yet in terms of uh, methodology in terms of email addresses to get those. We've in the past been able to, as a student graduates, get their email address so that we can send out uh, survey announcements that they can participate online. Uh, we're going to use the online, the website for an online survey. We're going to use whatever student email addresses we have. We're also going to use parent email addresses, uh, ask them to be forwarded. We might utilize mail, we might utilize phone calls, all different types of efforts so that we can get the class of 2012 to participate in the surveys. Uh, we'll be looking at social media uh, to get their involvement. We may be offering incentives, uh, phone calling, different types because where in certain in the class of 2013 we have a controlled audience. Well, the class of 2012 we don't have that advantage. So we're going to utilize services and utilize uh, techniques that we've used in the past to try to get them as much uh, participation as we can. Uh, relative to the employee of Arlington employees, what we're going to do is we're going to use an online survey of targeted employers. So in other words, we're not going to necessarily uh, send an email to the uh, general manager of General Motors. What we want to do is target the people that we're going to contact, those people have to, who have direct experience, uh, direct skills working with former AISD students. So what we're going to do is we're going to contact the Chamber of Commerce and then subsequently work with TCC, work with UTA and any other organization so that we can build an employer list. Then what we're going to do is contact those employers and dig down to get the specific contact individuals, get their email addresses, so that we're sending the, uh, the survey notices, the online email blasts and things, to again, those people who have specific expertise and specific knowledge uh, of the skills. And then we will follow that up uh, with participation through social media, media releases, postcards, again, methods of contact to, to get people to participate. We'll keep the site active until we reach the goal, and we believe it's the best method because it focuses on the correct individuals. Again, we're not going to send out a full email blast. We're going to try to work with people who have specific experiences and who can specifically uh, participate and, con and comment on students. I'd be more than happy to enter any, entertain any questions that you might have. Dr. Reich. Thank you, President Barron. Mr. Cherko, the, uh, on both of these, for the, the student population as well as the employer population, what type of sampling size are, are you targeting or what's been discussed, and is it a statistically valid size? Or? For the student population, our attempt is to sample. Every, we're going to start with an audience of everybody. So we are going to attempt to contact uh, every single high school senior. Now, in terms of what we're going to get back, we're going to keep working to we can get as, as large a number of respondents as we can. With the no, employers... Hold on. Let me, okay. with, with that said, um, what has been your experience in the past as far as a, a reasonable rate of return on these surveys? In the past surveys, we've, we've only gotten about 250 respondents. Out of... Out of 2,500 2, that we've gotten in, in with the high school scene, with the class of current class. That's why we've looked okay. at different incentives, uh, perhaps offering a television or that sort of thing to try to increase the participation, to utilize the parents a little bit more, to utilize the social media sites so we can get higher. Because right. within the addendum of the uh, RFQ, the objective was to try to push it to get closer to a 500 respondent base. And that's what we're going to try to shoot for. And uh, with your previous uh, survey experience in this category, do you have a, a comfort level for capturing 
uh, a, a true representative sample of the student body demographic as far as the low performers, the at-risk versus the overachievers and everywhere in between? Or is it a certain subset population only that you see mostly? or what? In the past surveys that we've done, uh, the questions have focused on uh, demographic issues and they've also focused on academic types of issues. The survey that we had before was like about 17 questions. So some of the issues, some of the items that you're looking at were not included in those questions. So that part, I can't tell you whether or not is representative. But in terms of the sample that we got, we, were, we would like to have had more, but we were pleased with the results. And as we tracked out uh, the current class, the 18-month class, and the five-year class, uh, there was some very good data to to be given and on uh, with that you, you said you had 250 was that the the initial and then what was left I mean did you just survey resurvey those 250 at 18 months and five no. years or no I tried at, the whole thing again tried the whole thing again and w was your number pretty consistent at 250 or did it decrease or increase I believe we were pretty close to we were only allowed to do this once over the course of the whole the whole five-year cycle Huh. Uh, and I believe we were pretty close to that 250 mark again. Okay. And the the scope of of this project with us is just the initial uh, post grad uh, survey, or is this also for uh, further out? Initially, it is for just the class of 2012. Uh, we'd like to hope that we can continue to do that, but that was not discussed past 2012. Okay. Or 2000, class of but it's for just that the immediate graduation, not 18 months out or, you know, any, not post uh, graduation surveillance, if you will, not 18 months or five years. Not as of this point, no. Okay. Okay. And then, so now on to the employee or employer uh, portion. Uh, if you can discuss the similar items as far as sampling size, we have not been, valid. we've not been given the number of respondents that the district, uh, wants us to include within the full sample. We are going to uh, approach the chamber and the different TCC and UTA and build a list from that point. Um, we're not sure yet. I don't know what that list size is going to be. I don't plan to shorten the list by any means. And working with them, are they going to be able to give you an idea of right away employer groups that know actively that they have AISD hires out of that? Uh, well, I don't know if it's out of 2012 class. It's just in general. AISD I believe hires. we would have to uh, dig deeper. I'm not sure. I don't believe the chamber has a list of employers. Uh, of Arlington students who are employed in certain areas. But that's the goal of the survey, that is correct? The goal. So, mm -hmm. so how, how, what's your methodology beyond that? To that's what I said. We're once we get the list, we're going to need to contact the employers and get the correct contact people to li to uh, survey. And it, we, one of the questions we're going to have to ask is whether or not they have Arlington employee, Arlington students, uh, working for them okay. over past a certain number of years. Seems to be kind of tough. Okay. All right. And then, uh, what is the the uh, the outcome uh, or the desired outcome of these survey results? Uh, obviously, it's uh, overall satisfaction. But is there any specific targets that that you've identified uh, that we uh, uh, will be looking at as far as in line with our strategic plan? Uh, We've not sat down to review the survey, to design the survey, to identify the objectives. What those point. metrics are going to be yet. We don't know okay. that Okay, so that's still to come. Okay. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turkle. Thank you. The final survey of the five uh, that, was, that were included with the RFQ is um, a graduating senior survey for the current year graduating class, class of 2013. Uh, and the administration is recommending that uh, this particular survey be performed by Gibson Consulting Group. So we have with us this evening, Greg Gibson from Gibson Consulting.
President Barron, Dr. Cavazos, members of the board. Uh, it is a thrill to be here. This is uh, my first visit to the Arlington ISD school board meeting, and we are very excited about the prospect of having you um, as a client um, for our firm. I'm going to go through and tell you a little bit about the firm, and uh, then Marshall Garland, who's uh, sitting on the first row, is going to come talk about the technical aspects of this particular survey. Uh, Gibson Consulting Group is a K-12 consulting firm. Um, all we do is K-12 education consulting all over the United States. We do research and evaluation, surveys, internal audit, we do efficiency studies, we do technology, data dashboards, but everything is committed to the public education and we do it all over the United States. And we've worked in some of the largest, six of the largest 12 school systems in the United States. ESR Consulting Group is Eileen Reed. Eileen Reed is a subcontractor. She's worked with us recently on the Clark County engagement in Nevada, as well as uh, she's working with us right now on a project in Fairfax County, Virginia. And she is the former uh, uh, deputy director at Region 13, where she led several statewide turnaround, district turnaround initiatives and programs. She's very familiar with college readiness and STEM programs, and she consults with school systems on, on those particular programs. And she will be involved in the, in the tail end of this work in terms of developing, using the survey results to actually develop action plans uh, for the school system. We have a separate research unit in our firm that does program evaluations at the state, uh, regional, and district level. And we, we do, like I said, we do this work all over the United States. Uh, but particularly surveys, we've done, uh, this is a list of, of survey uh, clients that we've done recently. And uh, one of the more recent ones, if you wanted to look and see what our, our survey results look like, the school district of Lee County, Florida, um, was done uh, just this past year. And their uh, survey, the survey results are actually posted on their website. Um, but this gives you a list uh, of the types of survey clients that we've done. We are also experts uh, um, significantly enhanced by um, Eileen Reed's uh, participation in this project and school turnaround and college readiness. Uh, our firm has also been involved in doing performance audits, developing action plans, and cost estimates for different interventions. I have particular experience in evaluating the cost of alternative instructional arrangements that may be um, identified as being more beneficial for certain types of students. And we've done uh, similar projects where we've actually made recommendations to school systems for over 200 school districts across 18 states nationwide. So I'm going to turn this over to Marshall now, and he will cover the technical aspects of our project. And again, I'm just thrilled to be here. We're excited about the prospect of working with Arlington ISD. Marshall? Hello, I'm Marshall Garland. Uh, I'm a research and evaluation consultant in Gibson Consulting Group. Um, as Greg sort of mentioned, our presentation pertains primarily to the uh, graduating class of 2013. Um, when we sort of designed our, our response to the, to the RFQ and um, even in the oral presentations, we thought it was really important to kind of situate this in a broader survey effort that the, dis that the district's undertaking. Um, so we may be focusing on a sort of component of that, which is just the graduates from the uh, class of 2013. We think it's really important to coordinate both item development and also the action planning phase across those survey, survey instruments. It'll give us some level of comparability of items so we can compare responses between uh, parents in terms of their perceptions of how well students were trained in math or reading. And then we can also compare those responses to, to, to their students uh, from the graduating class of 2013. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the um, instrument, instrument development phase. So the way the presentation is structured is I'm going to talk about the different phases that um, we're going to uh, 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 sort of undertake during the survey development, um, administration, analysis, and reporting processes. Um, during instrument development, we, we intend to co uh, collaborate um, a lot with district stakeholders. We found this to be a really good opportunity to engage a lot of different people in the district that may have something they want to uh, contribute to the survey. Um, for instance, career and technology education staff may have some items, may want to contribute some items asking about kids' exposure or familiarity with the type of um, career and CTE courses that are offered. Um, this is also a good opportunity to get some buy-in from a lot of different stake district stakeholders and also campus stakeholders. 
Um, again, we plan on consulting, quite, sort of engaging everyone that's involved in the survey effort, both the Studer Group and um, Raymond Turco and the Associates, to again create some items that could p allow uh, comparability across the different survey instruments. <coughs> Um, during instru devel instrument development, we're going to pull from um, existing survey instruments where it's possible. Um, Austin ISD, which uh, I actually led the sur uh, uh, high school exit survey um, undertaking at that district, has uh, an existing instrument with some items that uh, are non-proprietary um, that may be relevant to, to the district. Um, those will be discussed in the discussions with district stakeholders, particularly when we're talking about aligning the items to the district strategic plan, um, which I think is a really important component to this, uh, to this survey. Um, and then during instrument development, I should, I should say at the tail end of instrument development, we're going to pilot test the instrument, um, which using typically a convenient sam sample, asking people, we can monitor response times, look at res or, or, or gauge response or, or uh, uh, survey take or comprehension. Um, during the survey administration, this has several key features. Um, one of the first, I think our goal here is to minimize the burden that we're placing on campus staff, um, teachers who are going to be affected by this, um, this survey administration, um, principals uh, are also going to be affected. So we want to sort of take all the onus or try to absorb as much of the onus for the survey uh, um, uh, administration as possible. So the first thing that we plan on doing is working with uh, district, sta or district stakeholders to identify some basic rules for determining which stu student should be surveyed. There could be 11th graders who are on track to graduate by the end of uh, the 2012-13 school year. Um, and so we're going to work with them to determine how their credits are progressing. Are these kids look, are there certain sort of standardized rules that we can use to determine whether a kid's projected to graduate so we make sure that we, we include them uh, in the sample. We've also found that it's important to identify a campus coordinator um, at every campus that is going to be uh, included in the survey. Um, they help us coordinate a lot of the efforts, particularly distributing survey packets to teachers. Uh, and they also, frankly, kind of help us hound teachers um, who ha may have low survey response rates. Um, they're, they come in, they're very handy uh, when doing that. Um, Another thing that we, we want to do is, so we're talking, I, I, we really want to minimize the amount of burden we're placing on classroom teachers. Um, and teachers are overwhelmed. So what we plan on doing and what we've sort of, how we've written this, uh, or how we've designed a proposal is, we're going to create for every teacher um, a packet that says, these are the kids that are in your class who are scheduled to graduate. This is an identifier that you can use to get them to a, a, um, a, a terminal to take an online survey. And so they'll be able to track which students, particularly this is where the coordinator comes in and is key because they'll also have a similar list and be able to follow um, um, uh, how the survey responses. Um, and so every teacher is going to get one of those with a list of students, um, classroom, and also instructions. We've also found it helpful to have some sort of higher level district or higher level, a, a memo from a higher level district official, uh, particularly Dr. Cavazos um, is uh, if he can lend his way to this effort, I think our survey response rates will uh, increase substantially. Um, we're also going to work to facilitate publicizing uh, the survey effort within the district, so cre helping cr sort of draft the memos, do a lot of that sort of back-end work for you guys and then, uh, with, with your approval, of course. Um, and we're also going to monitor response rates. Again, teachers are, are overwhelmed, and so one of the things that we're going to do either <coughs> bi-weekly or weekly is essentially say, these are the kids that have taken the survey. These are the kids who haven't. Please get these kids to take the survey. Again, the coordinator can help us track down these um, scoff law teachers. Um, data analysis, for me, this is the fun part because I'm going to be the lead quantitative researcher. Um, I like to call this forensics, data forensics. So it's essentially me getting a bunch of data and finding weird patterns. So kids who just mark all five. Or on the substance use survey that I did at Austin ISD that says, they did drugs seven days a week for the entire school year. Um, that looks anomalous. We might want to flag that and maybe toss it. Um, 
We can also look at um, total response times. If kids are taking surveys in two minutes and they're designed to be taken in 15 minutes, that may be uh, suspicious. We also plan on reporting out at the school level major constructs. So the, the survey is going to have a number of items, and those items make up a construct. And we're going to report out at the campus level um, uh, 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 averages for, uh, for those constructs. We also plan on doing some intro inferential, again, fun stuff for me, um, inferential statistical analysis comparing differences uh, in important groups. <clears throat> So one of the things that attracted us to this RFP when we first saw it was this action planning. A lot of times we'll do surveys or we'll do even evaluation reports and we hand over um, the results and it sort of ends there, which can be kind of not satisfying for a researcher. We're going to work to develop action plans that not only reflect on our results, but I think it's important to coordinate that across all the survey results to develop sort of things that the district should do in response to areas where there's an opportunity to improve. So this will entail highlighting key findings, making recommendations. Um, Greg can also talk a bit more about this. This is something that he does um, throughout the country, essentially sort of going into districts, finding operational inefficiencies, and making re recommendations to improve those. Um, reporting, we, this, this is pretty straightforward. We'll provide a comprehensive written report that includes the sampling methodology, response rates, all that stuff, but also the um, outcome from the, or outcomes from the analysis that I conduct. Um, also in this will be included the students, or the school level data profiles and also the action plans. And that's it. If you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Dr. Reich. Have to stay consistent. Thank you, President Barron. Um, I appreciate all the information. Um, similar question as asked before. It seems that your goal is to go after 100% of those targeted for graduating 2013. Is that correct? That's right. The marginal cost of not doing it, or the marginal savings. Um, it's just sure. It's infinite. Sure. There's sure. No and you've got to. the captive it's audience, online. so it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, uh, same similar question, I, I would assume what the answer will be, but just in case, uh, as far as uh, defined measurables or metrics at this point uh, related to the strategic plan and outcomes besides general satisfaction, has any of that, that's still yet to be defined? And no, no. Will be yeah. coordinated with the three groups and administration then? So. Th that has not been defined. I've okay. reviewed the strategic plan and I've seen some opportunity. I mean, that's why actually one of the CTE, I, there was a CTE component to the strategic plan that I think that's a great opportunity to include some items around that on the on the survey. Okay, okay. Uh, sounds great. Uh, I, I really uh, personally appreciate the analytics side of it and uh, uh, I think Dr. Carter will be right there with you with uh, some of these things. So thank you very much. Appreciate sure. it. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Uh, Mr. Pompa. Um, just wanted to mainly say thanks for uh, the effort, this is, you know, uh, a lot more, I think, than what we even expected when we said we wanted surveys. And so uh, we knew we were going to get some analyses of the surveys, but uh, then to use your expertise, uh, your background to make some recommendations in, in terms of actions, I think that's even a little bit more than uh, as board members when, we're kind of, when we conceived this, what we're expecting. <coughs> and so uh, we do look forward to working with your firm and, and, and seeing the results and again uh, w what you're proposing to do is already pre pretty impressive so I'm excited about what we're doing here. Great. We're, we're very excited to, to work with you guys. Thank you gentlemen. Thank you. That concludes the presentation on from the three firms that we are recommending for survey work and again uh, there are a total of five surveys. Uh, the Total cost of all the surveys is $147,982. And uh, the uh, accountability and testing department will be coordinating the, the, the three surveys and the, the training work that, uh, that goes with those. So um, answer any additional questions that you all have. Is Dr. Carter going to write that check? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that uh, we'll have a hand in it in some way. I see. Uh, I'll take a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve uh, the recommendation for uh, the five contracts for the surveys as presented by the staff. Second. 
Motion by Mr. Pump, a second by Dr. Rice to approve the contracts. If there's no further discussion, please vote. All voting in the affirmative, the motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Powell. <clears throat> Thank you to the surveyors. I, I would just jump in. Uh, this was your first meeting here and you're from Florida. Come, come to these meetings all you want. It's a great party. <laughs> and I understand you have a, a car to catch, so hit the road. Okay, back to the original item A, consider the campus security infrastructure. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Barron. As we look at uh, campus security and review our uh, uh, security processes and our facilities, we've uh, discussed having really two aims here, and, and that is to have a short-term kind of review of our security uh, measures at our campuses, and then with our facility assessment, having a long-term view. And so Ms. Powell has a presentation about the short-term adjustments that are possible of, to ensure our students are safe uh, at our campuses. President Barron, board members, Dr. Cavazos, the security department and plant services department have been working on this uh, for a while, for over a month, and uh, we have been looking at ways that we can increase security, add some additional security, uh, particularly at our elementary schools. Our high schools and our junior high schools have school resource officers and they have um, assigned full-time security officers uh, from our staff. Uh, our elementary schools have neither. Um, our security officers are assigned to the elementary schools and um, our SROs will serve the elementary schools as needed. Uh, but um, throughout the day, there are many, many times, most of the time, when there may not be a security person or a police officer present at the elementary school. So we focused on that. So uh, just to, to give you an idea of the infrastructure that we have in place now, uh, we have uh, security cameras uh, at all of our schools. Uh, we have the uh, Raptor Visitor ID system. Uh, that is in place at our schools where anyone coming into a school must present their driver's license uh, and then they are screened through the Raptor system uh, to identify potential sex offenders. We have a keyless entry system that has been installed. The testing is going on now and that system will be fully operational by spring break. As Dr. Cavazos mentioned, uh, this the item we're going to speak about this evening really focuses more on a short-term solution. Uh, and a longer-term solution, uh, we feel, will be identified potentially through our facilities assessment. Uh, we have engaged uh, Jacobs Project Management uh, firm to conduct a full-scale, very comprehensive facility assessment of our district, and that will take place the spring and the summer. Um, as part of that, we will work with them to establish standards, what we want our buildings to have, what we expect our buildings to have, both from an instructional perspective in the classroom, what our instructional spaces look like, and then also from a, a perspective of security and also curb appeal, if you will. Uh, so we will work with them to develop those standards. We'll take input uh, from campus principals, we'll take input from the community, and in this particular piece we'll take input from uh, the Arlington Police Department to help us uh, develop standards for security. Um, once we have those standards, then Jacobs Project Management uh, and their team will visit each facility and they will evaluate the facility against those standards and then come back and identify for us the gaps, if you will, the things that uh, need to be added or modified in order to meet our standards. So from that, um, that, will, that will identify potentially long-term solutions and improvements for security. What we want to visit with you about this evening is the possibility of adding another layer of security at our elementary schools and that would potentially be a buzzer camera entry system. Uh, this particular system, again, is uh, something that we feel like that we can have in place uh, relatively soon, and uh, so it will provide us an additional layer of protection in the short term. The way that uh, the system works, quite simply, is that uh, all the doors are locked all the time at an elementary school after the school day gets started. Uh, we would install a buzzer and camera system and an intercom. 
uh, on the front door and we will install that on a door that is already wired uh, for the keyless entry uh, card reader. So that will help us uh, save money in this particular project. Uh, so again, the doors stay locked all the time after the school day starts. Uh, visitors will actually come to the door, they'll press the button, a uh, camera will project their image to a monitor in the office and then uh, the office personnel will control the door and with the intercom they can have exchange with the individual standing at the door. Uh, once inside the procedures are as they are today, uh, that individual will be directed to go to the office, um, they will be screened through the Raptor ID system before they're permitted any further into the building. Uh, we discussed this system. Um, with our uh, with pro uh, Jacobs Project Management, the firm that we've engaged to do our facility assessment, and asked their opinion on this. And their comment was that um, uh, this would be a good way to uh, add security to our buildings. And they did not see that as a potential detriment or something that they might come back along in the next few months and say, no, that's not really what you need. They, they felt like this would be a positive addition. Uh, likewise, we visited with our principals. Um, at a principal's meeting last week about uh, this particular system, a buzzer system, and we took input from them, and the input was very, very positive. Uh, and we have a number of principals here this evening that can address uh, your questions and give you their input uh, if you would like. Uh, we had actually uh, one of our principals, and she was not able to be with us this evening, who has worked in a district, actually there were two uh, in, in that group, who have worked in districts that have buzzer systems. And they both spoke very highly of them, were very positive, and said uh, had a minim minimal impact on uh, operations of the school, negative impact. So uh, we also called uh, a neighboring district, Garland ISD. Uh, they have had buzzer systems in their schools for six years and uh, the people we spoke with there spoke very highly of them as well and said they were very pleased with it. Um, it allowed them to get the people in place in some cases uh, when they knew they had an angry visitor uh, at the front door uh, to address the situation and uh, they said again uh, very minimal impact on on operations of the school so they were very very positive about that. Uh, one thing we know we'll need to do um, is uh, if we go forward with this type of system is develop some protocol and some training uh, for our schools on uh, operations and, and choices you make to open the door, not open the door, and, and uh, the logistical piece of this. Um, we have had made some inquiries and we've made an estimate of uh, the cost of this system and because we are going to propose installing this on a door that's already wired for the, the uh, keyless card reader. Um, we believe that uh, the cost for one system, which would be one per campus, uh, is approximately $4,000. 51 elementary campuses. Uh, we have a contingency factor uh, built in here in case we needed to make any changes to door hardware. Um, so the total estimated cost is $224,000. Um, I would recommend that we take this uh, or we charge this to surplus bond funds, the 2009 bond program. Uh, we have a significant surplus at the moment, uh, over $10.5 million uh, today uh, on projects that um, have already been funded. And so we feel like that this is within the scope of the work approved for the bond program because we had uh, included in the bond program there was funds for um, the keyless entry system. Uh, for fencing, for the uh, Raptor visitor ID system, and for additional security cameras. So this work is very much within the scope of uh, the uh, 2009 bond program. Uh, in order to just be proactive and, and to um, hopefully um, be very timely uh, on this project. We have actually put out an RFP to obtain some pricing. We're not committed by doing that. You certainly are not committed to, to making a purchase by simply obtaining that formal pricing, but we went ahead and we put out an RFP so that um, should the board decide to go forward with this, we can bring that back um, very promptly and have the board vote on, on the RFP award so that we can move forward. Our understanding is we're looking at, um, once the POs are issued, uh, approximately two months uh, for complete installation of the system. 
And this is what I, I think we've used the term internally very scalable. Um, we could certainly look at um, expanding the schools that uh, where we put this. Um, and so that, that's something that we built into that RFP is uh, some alternative pricing for additional locations. Uh, with that, um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have and uh, you know, our principals who are here, I'm sure would be happy to answer any questions you have. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Hibbs. <clears throat> Mr. Powell, I thank you for this presentation. I think that you laid it out uh, right on the mark. I, I, um, I like the fact that um, the district is uh, looking at our uh, partners in the city with the uh, Arlington uh, Police Department, other organizations to um, take in their thoughts. Um, you know, as parents, which I am of a uh, of a uh, child that's still in at Martin, uh, you know, we we are all concerned. Um, uh, you know, after hearing the events of the past few months, but it, as a someone that's knowledgeable of what needs to be done, um, I have no clue. And by going out and looking and asking these questions, I think is absolutely where we should be. Um, I support this measure um, uh, for the um, having the buzzers at you know each school. The additional cameras it'll give the uh, front office staff the the ability uh, to actually see a person and uh, determine if it looks like that would be a threat, you know, in the respect of their, uh, if in some way um, there may be something menacing about the person. Um, so I'm very supportive of this measure and I think that it comes in a very timely manner and um, um, would encourage the board to move forward with this one. Dr. Reich. Thank you, President Barron. Uh, Ms. Powell, I, I agree with everything that uh, Mr. Hibbs just stated. I have a couple of questions um, and I guess concern as far as the training on, on uh, uh, opening that door, hitting that buzzer, allowing them in. Um, we're not going to be able to cover every scenario, obviously. Um, what uh, is it part of the RFP process to work with these firms to help us, help the district uh, to be able to identify folks? I mean, I, I'm thinking if, if there's a, a psychopath that wants to get in, they're, they're not going to look the look. They're, they're going to look maybe like us kind of thing. Uh, uh, <laughs> Suit and tie. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know. Obviously, like I said, I don't think we're we can troubleshoot every possible scenario. But do, will these companies be able to provide you as a us as a district an, an added level of the training uh, for that type of thing? Or I mean, where, where is that part coming well, from? Well, and I, I think we're going to take input from. A number of sources. Um, the other districts, especially Garland, one in the area that we know has a buzzer system, we will reach out to them and, and obtain copies of their procedures and their training and ask about that. And yes, we will engage those firms to ask what, what information they can give us and then working with APD. And uh, James Smith is our security manager and he's here this evening. So I think uh, he, he may be able to answer that question better than I can. So see, oh, there he is. Yeah, I, I, and that, that's what I was wondering, you know, with working with the police department, uh, and come forth, Mr. Smith, I, I think that uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, police community probably has a lot of this type of information that, that's available, but I wonder Yes, sir, that's said. correct. We'll be working with the police department, uh, youth services commander, their department, recommendations from the SRO staff and crime prevention to develop those procedures and processes. Okay. It'd be like answering your front door basically at your house. You'll decide when somebody rings your doorbell, do you want to let them in or not? Have a conversation with them. 
it's pretty similar in those dynamics. Okay. And it's something I can work with my experience also. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pell, on the cost estimate, um, how how did you derive the 4,000? Was that looking at what s systems we've actually, are out there? We've or? had a conversation with a provider of this kind of equipment and asked them, you know, what on earth are, are we looking at here? And we sat down, we had a very specific conversation. Mm -hmm. We've actually, uh, they went back and revised their price estimate uh, even once uh, after we talked and we said, okay, if we put this on a door, one door, one that already has the, the keyless card reader on it, so it's already wired, um, and we asked them, what, what would we need in terms of equipment? And they said, well, here's the set. You're going to need the camera. You're going to need two monitors, two buzzers in the office, and um, you're going to need the buzzer uh, and the intercom. And so they helped us just identify the pieces that we'll need, and they've given us an initial estimate. So uh, there are a number of companies that can provide that equipment, and so uh, we have gone ahead and inspect it for the type of equipment, the components we need, and we put that out right now for, for bid. So this is, it, it is an estimate, right. uh, but that, that's how we came to it, was actually talking to somebody that, uh, that sells that equipment. Okay, and are you, as far as the scope of the RFQ or RFP, uh, is this uh, something that's going out to uh, these companies nationwide, or do you have limited scope? Or It's not limited scope, and we identified uh, actually even through internet searches of who, had, who can sell this particular equipment. And so I'm not sure how many we've mailed it to, but um, they're actually those those uh, RFPs, those proposals are due back on January 24th. It's uh, posted out on our website. We advertise, uh, we post the RFP on our website, and so uh, a number of entities monitor governmental right. websites looking for bid opportunities. And so right. we've reached out to the ones we could identify, but we've also advertised and posted on our website. Okay, and then the, the other question I had with in the RFP process or talking with this, this uh, company, um, what happens uh, with somebody that is eyes on that monitor? Do they have a, uh, or do these systems come with a, a mobile app mm -hmm. where they can take that camera feed with them if they have to run, make copies, or run down the hall, or is it a physical body at all times and they have to say, hey, I really need to go to the bathroom. Can you please watch this for five minutes? Uh, well, and, and I'm going to let Mr. Uh, Smith answer that question. You have typically two monitors, two, two door releases in the office, so you okay. have multiple opportunities for people to, to, to monitor. Okay. And, and that, that's correct. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Rice, did somebody would physically have to be at that location, okay. and if one left, then there would be another person that would need to be there to actually allow access into it. Uh, one of the good things about it, that it, it's scheduled to be on the door with the keyless access control, so another staff member from that facility could access the door. Somebody just happened to step away for a moment. All right. Okay. Okay. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Ms. Powell, was part of the system a, an intercom, too? Yes. Okay. Mr. Hogg? Thank you, President Barrett. Real quick question. Ms. Powell, what are there, uh, is there any expected ongoing costs with this? Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, and this is a mechanical system, it's and pretty, so pretty I, minimal. I think it's pretty, a pretty basic mechanical operation. See, one more time. There shouldn't be any license agreement once it's installed. It would be with a regular license agreement if it's connected to the keyless entry system unless something broke down. So mainly, it, ju mainly just some maintenance cost here and there? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, one other, you know, listen, someone wants in, they're going to get into our school. Um, this is not a be-all, end-all. I think it reinforces our Raptor system that we already have because I think sexual predators is one of the major issues yes, we have sir. to be addressing. So I mm -hmm. think it's a good idea from that perspective. How do we handle it? You know, I understand it on our elementary campuses. How do we handle this, and, and what's the protocol that's going to be projected for our high school campuses where there are multiple, multiple entry points to come in through our high schools? Well, an, initially what the recommendation is for the elementary campuses, again, when you get to the middle school and the high schools, you have additional elements there being law enforcement and security, okay. which are not on that campus. Okay. That's, so that's, I'm sorry. I was, I was thinking, so do you think we'll ever do this for high school? We... <laughs> 
<laughs> we can, it, you know, and uh, we ask. I mean, it would took, be a full time person to sit there and watch. We the door. took input uh, from all of our principals at principals meeting last week, and the principals, the high school principals, said they they weren't sure how efficient how how effective this could be, with, given the multiple entrances and the the traffic in and out that they deal with. But again, uh, you know, we have full time security officers and we have SROs at those yeah, schools okay. that uh, are monitoring the entryways at those front doors. Element. So, and again, you know, they have the keyless entry system too, and they have the systems to lock the doors uh, with the exception of that main entrance once the school day starts. So uh, certainly down the road, we can uh, expand this if, if we see that it's effective and that uh, we, we think that this is something we can manage efficiently. Okay. But the initial proposal is for elementaries. Thank you. I'm glad we're doing this. The uh, the junior high school principals, likewise, they they were very positive uh, about uh, the system and the possibility of getting it. So, uh, I think there's support there from them. I see it as a natural fit. Some of our junior highs having this, maybe sooner than later. Um, but I, I think it's got to start with the elementaries and see how it goes, and then looking at our junior highs, mm -hmm. high schools. It's a whole different story. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you'd even manage that from a protocol standpoint. So, Mr. Papa. Thank you, President Barron. Uh, totally agree with you all. I think the safety and the security of the of the student population has to come first and foremost. And I think the the reality today really is different from what was what it was even six months ago, in terms of what we have to consider. Uh, because the atrocities that we saw in December in, in, in uh, New England, uh, I think opened our eyes, uh, all of our eyes to really the, the, the potential tragedy that can occur anywhere. And then just more recently, closer to home, we had uh, Lamar High School in a, in a lockdown situation for the majority of the day. And of course, I want to commend our, our staff and the APD for uh, the excellent job that they did in handling that situation. Um, on the keyless entry uh, that we have at the different campuses, is that on every exterior door so that at one time all the doors will be controlled through this mechanism? It, not every door has a card reader on it. Uh, Mr. Smith can give you the breakdown. We have different numbers at the elementary, junior highs, and high schools because there are more doors the bigger the school gets. But uh, they're all locked after the school day gets started except that main entrance. And then a number of the doors at each campus has the, uh, the keyless card reader on it through which uh, an authorized individual can access, uh, gain access into the building. So Mr. Smith, you want to tell the number? Uh, yes, sir. On the elementary campuses, I believe we have four doors with the keyless access control, one on each side of the campus. Middle schools should have approximately six, and high schools about eight. And they have different setups and structures, so that's why I submit on the high schools and a number of people on that campus. How certain are we that uh, at the time that all those other exterior doors that are supposed to be locked are locked? Oh, well, that's the periodic checks that we have between the administrative staff there on the campus, security, and along with the teachers. So. They go by and check them to make sure they're not propped open by a student or somebody trying to go in and out. Correct. That, that, that's my concern that we may be thinking uh, almost a safe s sense of security that all the doors are locked and yet there's one or two that are propped open or, or whatnot. That's correct. Um, what about changes to the, to the access? I'm really familiar with uh, Ditto Elementary. We're in the process of kind of reconfiguring the the access to to the school uh, I think there's other schools that are that are in similar situation and, and where are we with those well and we are continuing to evaluate all of our schools and I think that um, there are some that, uh, that that may need some extensive um, vestibules construction or renovation to create a vestibule I think that with this this gives um, pretty uh, not immediate, but within a couple of months, we can have security systems in place on all of the schools and then work through the facility assessment to see really what makes sense with the, the vestibules and which schools would benefit most from those. And what's the timeline once they, you said maybe two months to get started. Uh, once uh, the contractor gets into the school to finish the project? Well, that, once they get the equipment delivered, we're going to... Uh, 
the board approves the plan tonight, we believe we can bring back the RFP for action at the February 7th board meeting. Following that, we, if the board approves the, the, the RFP award at that meeting, we would issue a purchase order. Once the um, manufacturer delivers the equipment, it's two months then to get it installed. Two months will be how long it will actually physically take to get all the schools yes. done. Yes, and that's what the, yeah. So maybe by the end of March or April, every single school will, uh, will Probably, I, I would say, we're probably looking more at the end of April into May. Because once we bring it back February 7th, we issue the PO, if the equipment gets delivered, uh, then it's probably uh, end of April. W one of the things that uh, that we kind of discussed as we were working on the uh, ditto project was the the glass just pretty much every door is 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 made out of glass in the school district now there was an individual there i don't remember his name but he said some of the uh, doors and some of the windows i believe are they're already using a different type of glass they're going to a plated glass that is has kind of a, a vinyl inside and uh, uh it's more shatterproof so that if you if you if you hit it if you I think there's instances where they were hitting it with a chair or a bat or something like that it cracks but it doesn't completely collapse mm -hmm. um, what are our thoughts in, in terms of going ahead and uh, addressing all the doors that have that type of glass that will just pretty much you know shatter and allow easy access to the building we, we can cost that out um, we would probably need to determine whether we want all doors all the way around the building uh, and so I don't know if you have any additional comment on that, but yes, we can begin to look at that. I, I think that's something that our, our facility assessment would also take into account if we determine that one of our standards is we have that type of glass uh, in all of our buildings, they could tell us which ones uh, are needing that and, and help us quantify that cost. But if that's something that we're needing to go ahead and, and look at now, we can we can do that. Mr. Smith, do you remember that, that discussion? How did, how did that come about and what, what was the, the, we decided to go ahead and, 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 and retrofit the glass there at, at, the, at that entrance? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think they were talking about the laminate that it would go over the glass and make it more resistant, as you mentioned. Uh, and the situation in Connecticut actually went through the glass and shot through the glass. So that would be another deterrent, another barrier that would add in there, but we have not examined the cost it would take to go not just on the doors, but on the windows that would be accessible from the ground level. Um, we can, we can, we can listen to what everyone else believes, but I, I think we should go ahead and address that. I, I know that we're going to do a more thorough and more comprehensive uh, facility evaluation, uh, but I can assure you that, I mean, I just can't imagine that they would come out with a recommendation not to uh, strengthen, especially the doors. I'm not sure about the windows. The windows are a little tougher access, but certainly the doors, every door that we have, uh, exterior door is a glass door, and so it doesn't take more than a pretty stiff kick to, to break that glass, whereas I understood that the, the plated glass wasn't, the, the, it wasn't cost prohibitive as we talked about it for that particular project, but it might behoove us to, to look at the at the price and, and the logistics or something like that to again just secure the the entrance uh, make it a little bit more difficult to to access I know we're not going to prevent ev anyone and everyone but if we can slow them down if we can uh, make it really really tough for them to have access to the school uh, perhaps we can uh, we can avoid a situation like what they had in, in, in Connecticut Dr. Reich. Thank you, President Barron. Um, I, as far as what Mr. Pompa just stated, I wouldn't be opposed to us looking at that. I, I think it's an absolute direction that we're going to be going. Uh, I think with our facility assessment, we're, we're going to have that definitely as a recommendation. I think we're going to have other regular alarm system recommendations for open doors and windows uh, as far as timers before somebody signaled that, hey, this thing's open and shouldn't be. Uh, I think all that's coming. Um, so I, I don't have any problem with that uh, uh, at all. I, I think uh, if it's not too much burden on, on you guys as staff to kind of research that out as far as cost and things, maybe that's something we can talk about. 
the uh, final question that I had was, uh, I know this was very quick, so I think I know the answer, but this has not gone through CBOC at all. Is no, that correct? Uh, we felt like that uh, this was something that we wanted to expedite. Sure, and so, sure. Uh, That's what I figured. CBOC doesn't have a meeting until uh, right. the end of February. So. Right. Well, if, if, if you could just communicate to them that this is what we've done tonight and that kind of thing, that would be sure. very appreciated. And uh, with that, I'll uh, make a motion uh, to approve the uh, the funding source being the 09 uh, bond funds uh, in response to this RFP and look forward to it coming back for us to vote on, on the company and the dollars in the future. Second. Motion by Dr. Rice, second by Mr. Hibbs to approve the continuation of the project with the 09 bond funds. Please vote. All present voting in the affirmative. Go ahead. Thank you. Last discussion action item is to consider resolution to suspend portions of EIA local. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Barron. Uh, and thank thank you, all those. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, thank the principals thank who attended. You. <laughs> this evening, we'd like to uh, bring to for your consideration a resolution to suspend portions of EIA local that deal with STAR end of course testing assessments and the implications with the 15%. Uh, Evan Smith, the executive director of secondary instruction, will. Uh, Give us a brief presentation on this item. President Barron, members of the board, and Dr. Cavazos. Uh, the proposed bef a resolution before you addresses the end of course exams for STAR at the high school level. There has been much discussion over the past two years regarding this 15% requirement as part of the student's final grade. Recently, our new commissioner, Michael Williams of Arlington, announced that he was allowing distri districts once again to defer the implementation of this requirement as stated in our EIA local policy. As you may recall, the commissioner last year did this very same thing. So this is the same resolution with different dates. We recommend that the resolution to suspend the portions of the EIA local for the 2012-2013 school year <coughs> with regard to the EOC STAR assessments uh, go forth. The rationale for this includes not only the, the 15 percent, but along with many accountability issues which are being taken up now before the legislature this session. Move to approve. Mm -hmm. Second. Motion by Mr. Pompa, second by Mr. Hibbs to approve the resolution as published in the board agenda. Thank you. Any further discussion? Please vote. Thank you, Evan. That brings us to the consent. Are there any items to be withdrawn from the consent agenda? Ms. Powell. President Barron, board members, Dr. Cavazos, uh, it's my privilege this evening to report our donations. Uh, for our bids, we have six bids on the agenda, and in all cases, the administration's recommending the lowest bids and the bids that represent the best value to the district. As far as donations go, um, we've received donations, our schools have received donations from the Arlington Alliance for Youth, South Arlington Rotary Club, Hurricane Waste Systems, Dan Diaper. The Arlington High School Wrestling Booster Club, the Arlington High School Golf Booster Club, the Arlington High School Choir Booster Club, the Gene and Jerry Jones Family Charities, New World United Methodist Church, Lamar High School Band Booster Club, KW Vending Management Services, Lamar High School Volleyball Booster Club, the Independent Insurance Agents of Tarrant County, Martin High School Band Booster Club, Martin High School Orchestra Booster Club, St. Barnabas United Methodist Church, the Seguin High School Starline Booster Club, the Seguin High School Choir Booster Club, 
Pantigo Lions Foundation, Safeway, the Bowles Junior High School Orchestra Booster Club, St. Matthew's Catholic Church, Ditto Elementary School PTA, Life Touch National Studios, Joe and Doreen Bruner, Hill Elementary PTA, Moore Elementary PTA, the Pope Dads Club, FirstBook.org, Rush Creek Baptist Church, Glamour Craft Studio, and the Short Elementary School PTA. Uh, the donations that we're presenting for consideration this evening total $91,816, which brings our year-to-date total to $619,602. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Thank you to our generous community. Can I get a motion on the consent? Move to approve. Second. A motion by Dr. Rice, second by Mr. Pompa to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? Please vote. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Consent passes. I don't know. It's like having, like having children around here. Um, uh, we have no cards for the open forum for non-agenda items. That brings us to the superintendent's report. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Barron. This evening, I'd like to share some information about some events that have uh, occurred the last couple of weeks. The uh, 2013 Texas Rangers Hispanic Caravan visited the Arlington ISD uh, Parent Involvement Event at Sam Houston High School, January 10th. Uh, Spanish uh, broadcaster Elena Ornelas and Benji Hill were there, as well as outfielder uh, Angel Beltre and pitcher Joaquim Soria. The group talked about the importance of family involvement uh, and what that did for their experience in school. Uh, the players explained how the Parents didn't leave their uh, education up to chance. They actually planned for it uh, consistently throughout their uh, upbringing. Computer labs were open afterwards so that parents could sign up for Parent Self-Serve, which we had a number of parents sign up for the first time for Parent Self-Serve so they could uh, keep track of their students' progress as they uh, go through school. And uh, Mr. Hogg was there also and joined us for that event. Tuesday evening, Gunn Junior High celebrated its 40th anniversary. Uh, Floyd Gunn's daughter, Susan, spoke about her father and how much he enjoyed uh, the school and the, and the school district, having served on the school board for 18 years. Uh, a special mural of, of, uh, of the Gunn Gators was, was uh, presented, and uh, the artist was Smitty, uh, who has been helping the campus uh, and, and has helped the, the network there with their artwork. And they'll have a school-wide pep rally tomorrow to celebrate this anniversary. And this concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Passos. Any board member reports? Wow. Dr. Reich, any secretary information? Uh, the only one was for the district to look at the uh, uh, beginning the cost analysis and further study on uh, front entry door reinforcement. That's all I have. Thank you. I want to thank again the uh, Miller Fiddlers for providing us with the musical entertainment under the direction of Holly Barton and the Williams Elementary School students with their art teacher, Andrea Powers, for presenting the board with lovely paintings that we will take home and put on our walls. We're adjourned. <laughs>